What's Happening Go Community. It's officially the busy time of the year in terms of big titles coming out, so we're going to look ahead at the holiday season of gaming in 2019. We've also got a ton of new games to talk about, including Children of Morta, Jackbox Party Pack 6, One Night Stand, Ghostbusters the Video Game Remastered, Neocab, Stranded Sales, Ping Redux, and Sniper Elite 3. Like I said, busy time of the year. This is The Gaming Outsider. Greetings, programs, and welcome to episode 267 of The Gaming Outsider, a video game podcast with a focus on our incredible community. It's Monday, October 21st. I'm your host, Scott Clark. I'm joined, as always, by my fellow co-host. First off, a guy who missed out on yet another Go Gathering this past weekend, Mr. Zach Parkerson. Well, you guys got to stop getting together. I get tired of missing stuff. It's not going to happen, man. We had a good time. You missed out. It was a lot of fun. I, uh, yeah, you guys get, uh, you guys get messed up. No, no, no. It doesn't, doesn't even I mean, there was some drinking going on for sure, but uh, I... I Almost lost my voice playing Rocksmith with uh, uh, Aaron Hughes the second, who brought Rocksmith. Like it's a it's a Guitar Hero, but with a real guitar. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember when it was all the rage. Yeah, he brought it. He actually brought his entire PC rig, and his PC rig is no joke. It's it's like a meter long. It's it's insane. Uh, but uh, I can't can't play guitar, so I just sang along with everything and blew out my voice, which was awesome. So yeah, it sounds a little blown out. It yeah, I'm I'm a little under the weather, as it were. But, Zach, it's always good talking with you. I wish you could have been here, man. It was it was great. Playing Killer Queen Black with eight people in one room. Oh, now that sounds fun. Oh, man, that was a good time. That was a good time. Uh, also joining us, a guy who definitely ain't afraid of no ghost, Mr. Chris Behrensmeyer. What's up, man? Yeah, buddy, what's up? Not much. You were there. Like, well, you showed up late. You had to go to like a stupid wedding or something. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Was I, was, was... I was there, but I wasn't there. I don't understand, but okay. Are those that you're worried about going to be listening to this? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Well, you uh, were not there. You were there in spirit. Yes. Yes, I, I was. Say. You were there in spirit. Emotionally. But I'm telling you guys, you both missed out on an awesome, awesome time. Uh, I got to see so many. Well, Spencer Cushing, our, one of our newest writers, was there. He and his wife, Paige, who got married on Friday. I hung out with us on Saturday. Do they have a gaming outsider themed wedding? Um, I did not ask. I should have. Uh, I think they just yeah. went to the the park and whatever. So it was, but it was really Gross. cool that they were there. Uh, Kevin Honigford and his kids were there. That was pretty awesome. Like I said, Aaron and Desiree were there. Who else am I missing? Um, I apologize, whoever I'm I'm missing. But obviously, Chad and Christina and Owens and Bob. Uh, just a house full of people. Lots of kids. Lots of kids. It was, Maybe it's good I missed out. It was it was a bit nutty, but uh, yeah, we played some Killer Queen Black, which uh, was shockingly easy to set up with eight people because you had to have two switches to do that. I was uh, surprised once we figured out what you had to do, how how simple it was. The only thing is, is that with Killer Queen Black, once you start a lobby, there's no way to back out of the lobby and get back to the main title screen. You actually have to physically close the the software and start all over again. That was the only thing about that game that was that was a bummer, but huh. it's a little weird. That was uh, that was a good time. Played some Jackbox Party Pack Six. It was quite the party. Uh, obviously, Rocksmith, and uh, it was it was it was a good time. Can't wait to do that again. I want to do that more often because it was just it was just too much fun. So, how have you guys been? What uh, what's been new with you guys? Um, well, uh, I went to a wedding and I watched a Star Wars trailer. Yes, we can't talk about the Star Wars trailer too much, Zach. There were lightsabers. <laughs> yes, there were lightsabers. No joke, we were getting ready to record this episode, and Monday Night Football is happening as we speak, and the trailer was going to take place during halftime, and I kind of said, hey guys, can we wait a few minutes so we can watch the trailer? And you guys were nice enough to let me go ahead and do that. It's good because, you know, we're all, we're all uh, proper geeks here and love Star Wars, so we've just been hanging over our heads the whole time. Yeah, I would have been sitting here for two hours going, man, I wish I could go watch that trailer right now. And I'm yeah, glad yeah, to be like, yeah, can we, can we rush the show along? I'm trying to get that Star Wars trailer. Yeah. Can we, can we, let, let's get this, let's, let's get this, <laughs> this party going. But, uh, it was, it was awesome. And I purchased my ticket. I didn't, don't know if I told you guys, but I got the last two seats that are together 
at the showing that I was trying to get that aren't in like those first three rows. You know what I'm talking about? Like in a theater, the first three, they're like right under the screen. Yeah, well, if it's an IMAX, it, that just hurts your neck. Right. So I got the last two together in the upper section, and there's little single seats all over the place. But uh, I am excited. December 19th, 6 o'clock, I will be there. Come, <laughs> I can't wait. Come to think of it, that's how you and I saw Endgame. We did. We were in, like like in the, the third second row, row for the IMAX <laughs> showing. I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, it was. It was How'd you guys uh, like Endgame? I oh, liked it. Had, I we cried. Had, we had a blast. We didn't cry oh. nearly as hard as the 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 girl next to us. You remember? Oh, Harrison? dude, she just just literal buckets. Yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of sobbers when I saw it. So it was Endgame. It's good, not great. They say. I thought it was great. I I will. Good. I will disagree. I enjoyed it very very much. Well, it was no Infinity War. I will agree well, on that, but. That final battle, are, I guess. That final battle. Mm. On your left. Spider-Man killed people. It doesn't make any sense. It's okay. <laughs> I liked it. Anyway. It's That's not cool. You would never do that. You hear me? You hear me, Russo? I forget you're a Spider-Man purist. Ugh. Anyway, uh, Star Wars trailer was dope. It was really good. I can't wait to go watch it a few more times and dissect it and try to figure out what I think is going on. But uh, it was a good trailer. And for those of you that are that are worried, we're not going to say anything. But I will say the trailer did not, uh, didn't really give away too much. I feel like there weren't any big revelations. Um, you didn't learn anything the first trailer didn't tell you. Exactly. So, but uh, it was Kylo good. Ren's in this one. <laughs> it's a shocker. It's, Do you guys like him? It's in space. I liked I him better it. in the first one. Okay, interesting. Mm, I'm still fenced. I love that, yeah. He's probably like my second favorite Star Wars character now. Really? Out of all of them? Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen how his story ends, so it's hard to commit. Right. Start. But it's like. Star Killer for life, bro. Oh, my God. Well, he doesn't. He doesn't count anymore. He never uh, existed. Well, welcome to the Gaming Star Wars podcast. Hey, Star- yeah. Let's talk. Uh, are you supposed to talk about video games here? We are. Hey, there's a Star Wars video game coming out. Yeah. There is. And we, we will get to that for sure. We're going to be talking about uh, games coming out this Christmas. Before we get that, though, let's go ahead and jump into the week's news. First off, I thought this was interesting. The Switch hit 15 million units sold in the U.S. this past week. Uh, that tops the Wii U's lifetime sales. Uh, if you remember, the console launched back in March of 2017, and uh, sales for the first nine months of 2019 have actually been up 20% since last year. I assume that's due to the uh, newer models that dropped uh, including the Switch Lite, but also the one that's got like the better battery life and all that. So, what do you guys think? A pretty cool uh, milestone there for the Switch. Hey, that's awesome! Yeah, good, good for Nintendo after the Wii U debacle. Nice to see him uh, bounce back. It makes sense. Every every kid that walks into the chocolate store I work at, uh, you know, if I ever talk to them about video games, they all want a Switch. Yeah, my students are the same way. When I when I bring mine to school, they're just drooling over it and asking their parents for one. So you're welcome, Nintendo. I've sold you 25 switches this Christmas, but uh, I was I was a little more surprised that there were actually 15 million units of the Wii U sold. I I feel like that number, the number yeah, I of thought it was, I would have assumed it barely cracked double digits. That's what I thought too. I was 15 million was was crazy. I I, I know that that system gets a lot of hate. I still really like the Wii U. It, I I enjoyed a lot of the games on it. I liked what they did with it. Um. I still have a lot of my old save data on there, I believe, and uh, I'll probably never touch it, but I dug it. I, I didn't see in the article, but was that just the U.S.'s Wii yes. U sales? Yes, just just uh, U.S. Well, I mean, 330 million plus people in the U.S., 15 million isn't that big of a number, but it's still a decent number. Well, considering that they call the Wii U a, a failure... That that seems like a pretty sizable number of units that's sold. I mean, I guess, you know, Nintendo considers 15 mun- million units to be a failure. Yeah. I, well, 15, it's 15 million just in the U.S., and then the Wii U worldwide sold 13.5 million. So most of them were sold in the U.S. Is that what you're saying? According to the, according to the article on the format, and the Wii U, like worldwide, sold 13.5 million units in its entire lifespan. And the Switch hit 15 million just in the U.S. Right. Yeah. So, so worldwide, it's got to be even higher. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, I had that. I had that backwards. So, okay. so the Wii U only had 13 and a half million worldwide, right? Whereas the Switch is already at 15 million US, just the US. And you know that right. a lot more of those sold in Japan than outside of the US. Yes, for sure. Yeah, especially with yeah, they have a very portable mentality. Mm-hmm. So, so I still love my Switch, and yeah. um, I'm thinking of getting a second one. But yeah, we'll see, see, when when I when I think failure, I think. The, the Virtual Boy only sold 120,000 units. So to me, that's a failure. I didn't realize that only sold 120,000. That, that makes mine feel a lot more valuable. Yep, and I have two. Look at you, you couldn't, baller. You couldn't pay me to have one. Oh, man, it's, it's pretty fun to have and watch people play it for the first time if they've never experienced it. And then, well, yeah, I guess that might be fun. Then they take their, the headset off and they're like, oh, my God, the, the world hurts. Well, especially nowadays because people have actually played VR, and so when they go to put something on their head, they assume they're going to be getting a VR experience, and that's not what the Virtual Boy is. Uh, it's, it's, it is VR, in a sense. In a sense, but there's no motion, there's no, you know, there's no head tracking or anything like that. It's just straight up playing a game in, in three dimensions, yes. fixed. And it's all red and black, and it makes your eyeballs burn and feel like you've haven't seen the light of day for about six months when you when you finally come out of that thing for five minutes. I was about to say, have you ever played the Tetris that's on there? Is it Tetris? Not Tetris Fear. It's Tetris 3D. Tetris 3D. I haven't. That's got to break your brain. Oh, yeah. Especially because it's the wireframe version of right. blocks. And yeah. it's almost like putting a Jenga together. Yeah, I'll pass. <laughs> I'll just play Nestor's Funky Bowling instead. Waterworld, bro. <laughs> I remember, I remember I couldn't wait to play Red Alarm, and I finally played that, and that game was awful. Did not like that one. I think the only really good game on there was the Wario, Wario one, and it was just because it was a platformer. Yep. Uh, the mm. Super Mario Brothers one is not bad, where it's uh, similar to the original Mario Brothers arcade. Oh, you mean like the two-player, like, or where you hit the turtles? Yep. The pow block in the middle? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> this turned into the Virtual Boy kind of you say ow? I, I said pow with the pow block. Oh. <laughs> so I was trying to I was trying to be relevant to the conversation in any way. Trying to do a little foley in there. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Appreciate Playing it. bang. Well, speaking of Nintendo, a company called Analog is releasing a handheld console to play your old Game Boy games. Now, this isn't the first one that they've done. They've done one for Super Nintendo and Genesis in the past. But uh, this one's interesting because it's not really going to emulate the games. You'll be able to put the cartridges in there. It's going to there's something with that they're doing to trick the card to be able to play the game as if it were original hardware. So I know a lot of purists might uh, like that a little bit better than than an emulation. But uh, I think this is kind of cool. It's it looks like an original Game Boy. It plays Game Boy games, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color. It's going to have an uh, a color three and a half inch LCD display, and there's even going to be a, a dock that you can buy separately to be able to play it on a television if you wanted to. Um, and it's going to release sometime next year for $199. Chris, I have to assume that this is going to be in, in your collection at some point. I may have already pre-ordered one. <laughs> Only one? I'm shocked. Blown away. So I, I actually learned from my mistake. I didn't learn about Analog's products until later on. Mm -hmm. um, so I missed out on their first one, which was the Mini NT, which was their version of the Nintendo. Uh, boxed, those sell for about $1,200 now. Oh, geez. Uh, they are an incredibly stable platform. They play very well. I've actually played on the Super Nintendo version and the Genesis version. Uh, they play glorious. And how do they look on the screen? Because they're, you know, they're, they're, they're 16-bit games that, are u that used to be played on you know, tube TVs. So th they do have, like, some HD upscaling. But you can also add in, like, the scan lines. You can reduce the pixel count to make the edges look smoother or you can leave them entirely original to how they are. Uh, but they, they play amazing and a analog. The company has put a lot of love and devotion into making these systems as close to how the originals would play. They're just far more stable with newer technology. Hmm. The idea of having a Super Nintendo on the go sounds fascinating to me because I would love to go back and play some of those old JRPGs without having to bust out something on my TV just to be able to take with oh. me on the go. Oh, no, 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 I no. Have... The, the Mini NT, Super Nintendo, and Genesis are not portable. 
They are just oh, they're not. They are standalone systems. That's said it so dramatically. But give <laughs> oh, it enough no. time, Scott. They'll all be on the Switch. That's true. TikTok. I guess that's as portable as I'll get, but. I don't know. I think it's uh, really cool. I don't know that I want one. I don't really have a burning desire to play Game Boy games or Game Boy Advance games. There's a couple, but uh, I got enough to play. I don't need a $200 handheld. I'm I'm simply looking at it as an investment, so I don't have to buy thousands of dollars of AA batteries over the course of my life. <laughs> That's a good point, That's, because this one does have a rechargeable battery built into it, too. So one you don't way to... to look at it. Yeah. The machine looks slick. It does. It's a slick piece of, uh, looking piece of hardware. For $200, I kind of want the dock included. Yeah. I don't know how much the dock is. I have to assume it's 50 bucks, but that's also me that's my guess. assuming based on what Nintendo charges yeah. for their docks. Uh, yeah, but no, I think the dock thing's super cool. I get to play your Game Boy games on the TV and like a nice upscale thing. It seems like a neat product. It's just, uh, well, I guess this is the third one they've done, so they must be successful. Mm-hmm. But I was just wondering what kind of viability, fourth one, sorry, CB. Uh, just because it immediately makes you think, what's the viability of this on the market? But I guess it's a specialty product for specialty people. Yeah, they don't they don't make a lot of them, and when they sell out, they're done. They don't make anymore. Right. It it looks real cool. Man, now you're making me want one. Dang just because it. it looks cool. Well, no, I just think the idea of of being able to play those games whenever you want. What you brought up with the batteries, that's a really good point. I have an original Game Boy. And I've been storing it for a while, and I completely forgot that there were batteries in it. And if you leave batteries in a console like that for a link, any length of time, the batteries leak. And I got, you know, battery acid all over the inside some, of there. Some heavy corrosion. Oh, it's gross. But but how often are you going to play Game Boy games, Scott? You're probably right, Zach. And you're probably talking C- me out of it successfully. CB makes sense. You... You're going to buy it. You're like, oh, this is so cool. But you but you also have to remember, though, this isn't it doesn't just play Game Boy games. It's Game Boy, Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance. So play those Mega Man Zero games the way they were intended. So, I mean, <laughs> it to me, it seems a lot better option for people that would also like to play Game Boy Advance games, because that having that wonderfully backlit screen that this thing does, mm-hmm. it looks a hell of a lot better than the OG Game Boy Advance. Well, yeah. I mean, you remember playing even even the regular Game Boy games. You had to have like the right reflection of light. You, you know, you couldn't play it at at night. I remember sitting in the oh, car. Oh man! I remember I remember sitting in the car as a kid trying to play it with streetlights every you know, every like half yes, a block or whatever, I, trying to I've catch that there. little bit. <laughs> or I was thinking of you remember that game Boktai, the Hideo Kojima game. No, it plays a vampire hunter, but you had they had like a sun sensor on the cartridge. So you had to play it online because you needed sun power to kill vampires. Oh my god! You had to take it out in the sun on your Game Boy, so like the glare was just making it unplayable. But you needed the sun for your weapons. I have never heard of that. It's like Kojima making kids go outside. Basically, yeah, yeah. That's a good I, way to look at it. That's such a Kojima thing that I've never even heard of before. That's amazing. Oh man, I can't believe you haven't played Baktai. No, the, I haven't. It's called. It was called Baktai. The sun is in your hand. I can't you decide play, if I should be laughing or in awe of that. I just honestly. remember you play as a you play as a kid named Django. Django with a D. Yes. Is yes, the D silent? D. Uh, I would assume the D is silent. I just remember when the Django movie came out. I was like, oh, they, oh mm. <laughs> the only time I'd seen that name before was this Hideo Kojima portable game. I'm oh, that's kind of crazy. I'm the the only concern I have about this is looking at the back where everything kind of pops in for the, your cartridges. Uh, Game Boy Advance cartridges are like half the size of a Game Boy cartridge. Right. So I'm just wondering like how much of the Game Boy cartridge will actually stick out of the slot. Oh, that's a good point. Because, mm. I mean, sweaty hands slip and just wind up like snapping something. Especially Maybe if- it's like a pen where you could have like the push and release thing. No, no, no. They make it so that the, the Game Boy game, the original, is flush against the top. But then the Game Boy Advance game just goes further down into it. Yeah, but so remember, empty space in between there. Game Boy Advances, uh, their games have those like little T's that come off the sides. The lip, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they those don't won't fit all the way into what a normal Game Boy game would. I have no idea. Then I didn't maybe pay it's close a, enough attention. Maybe it's an open back. 
So yeah. So so like it so it goes a little rise along the top on the Game Boy cartridge, but if you put a GBA game in there, it's just sitting like halfway down the console. But it has like an open back. Yeah, I I I'm mean, that's, that's the, like my only curiosity about that is how it looks having the two compared in it. So hmm. you already well, pre ordered one. That's amazing. It looks cool. It does. You have to pay in full for pre order? Yes. Well, okay, never mind. I'm out. I'm are out. the pre orders still available? Uh yes, they are still available. So with with a lot of these I tend to when when I pre order something, I just pay in full. Because then I don't have to be surprised later when my bank account's like, hey, $200 is gone. You know, CB, we don't all have that life of luxury, okay? <laughs> well, in some places, you can't even do that. Like, if you pre-order on Amazon, they won't charge you until it ships, which which always sucks. I'm like, oh, yeah, I bought that. I like oh, that uh, Square Enix store gives you the option. See, they should have the option. Yeah. Speaking of, guess what I canceled this week? Stadia. I did. Mm. I assume just because you kept forgetting, I would assume. I did forget. I finally I finally went in and pre it took me a second to figure out how to do it. And it was not uh as easy as I thought it was gonna be was going to be. But uh I don't know, between all the negative press it's been getting and just how positive the X Cloud is looking, that's that's what I want more more than uh Stadia. Yep. I mean, not even Google seems confident in Stadia. It really seems that way, doesn't it? I've yeah. I've definitely been hearing less and less hype about the Stadia. Like, I don't even see the commercials on TV that much anymore. So, <laughs> well, did you hear their press release where they were talking about it about uh, how they're going to be using forward thinking with the technology, and they use the term negative latency? I'm not making this up. They said negative latency. They said that the AI built mm-hmm. into Stadia is going to predetermine your movements on what you're doing in a game. So it's going to preload what it thinks you're going to do. And if you do that, it's going to be done. I, I can't wrap my brain around how that works, but I that just seems like something that's at least five years in the future, if that is even a realistic thing. I don't even think that's a thing. Predictive button presses. It's there like, you go. oh, hey, you're playing this open world gaming. We're going to predict all like 70 movements your character can take at once. See, that's I would where guess per- it's like it's it's an AI that's like say you're playing Bloodborne, and it knows that oh when the boss goes to attack you always dodge to the left. So it so learns. We know, so we know to press the circle button before you will, so we reduce the latency. But at that point in time, if it's predicting my movements, is it playing the game for me? Yes and no, CV. <laughs> it's playing the game with you. We don't even need uh, Twitch streams anymore. You can just buy the game and watch it being played. Yeah. The, the Google Stadia, the, the system that plays the game for you. No, I, I'm, I'm way more excited for, for xCloud, especially if all I got to buy is that little attachment for a controller to put my phone in, I'm sold. I would, I would be more apt to buy Project xCloud and uh, make sure that my PS Vita is still using the Play Anywhere function. So... So you can do the PS4 games that way too. Yeah, i i would be more I would be more willing to play my PS4 than I would ever consider touching a Google Stadia. Well, especially because with Google Stadia, you have to go through a Chromecast. Granted, you get one if you buy the Founders Package or whatever, but still, I can just go through Wi-Fi with XCloud or with the Vita. I don't have a Vita, but I don't know. Just seems more of what I want to do. So. And if I'm only going to get one, I mean, I'm, I'm not knocking PlayStation by any means, but I'd rather be able to play my Xbox games like upstairs on the couch, you know, or, or somewhere with Wi-Fi. Playing Xbox okay is just poop. One. No, I don't do that. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I will. I'm not, I don't spend that much time in there. Don't lie. Not yet. All right, I got one more story to share with you guys. Riot Games was in the news this week. They announced a a, uh, a bunch of new games set in the League of Legends universe. This was really interesting because, you know, Riot obviously known for League of Legends, but they just said, you know what, we got this game, we're going to do everything else. Uh, so all these games are codenamed with a letter. So there's like a Project A, a Project L. Then we've got a fighting game. There's one that's a tactical multiplayer first-person shooter. There's an esports management simulation game, a card game, and some other project that uh, is kind of shrouded in mystery called Project F. And all these games are supposedly coming out in 2020, even though 
they're going media dark on it as a as a, a as of the official announcement. So does this get you guys going at all or or you think just whatever, it's riot? I think the idea of a riot backed card game sounds awesome. Okay. I just uh I don't really I keep looking for a good card game on mobile. If anyone has any, let me know in the Discord or on Twitter. You didn't like Hearthstone? Uh, I was gonna say I don't like Hearthstone. It really didn't do it for me. I keep waiting for uh that magic the gathering game they're doing on PC to jump over to mobile so I could just play that. Mm-hmm. Uh but the idea of, you know, I mean League of Legends is not a poorly made game. Right. So the idea of them making a card game for for phones and stuff sounds appealing. I'm more interested in the games that they're making because I don't I, I understand League of Legends is a big game and a lot of people like it. Uh it's definitely not something for me. So I'm more curious to check out the games in that universe especially around the characters that they've already built. So, But I wonder how many people that's, that would draw in because I don't know how attractive a fighting game is going to be. I mean, I'm not a big fighting game person anyway. How, how attractive a fighting game or a shooter is if I'm not familiar with the characters because I'm like, Chris, I don't play League of Legends. I'm scared to death of MOBAs. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, you're going to have to really draw me in with the story and not make me feel like I'm left behind because I don't know any of the lore of that series. I can't imagine. I think they know that. Well, right? but I mean, I mean, everything here ostensibly could be uh, an online multiplayer game. I mean, this Let's this first actually, person shooter might not have a campaign. It might just be like see. a an Overwatch style game. But do you really need to know what character you're playing as in a in a shooter or a fighting game? You just got to find the one that plays the best. You didn't know who Ryu was back in the day. No, no, you're right, and I'm not disagreeing with that at all. I'm just saying that I'm less interested in multiplayer games. I'm more interested in a narrative-rich, story-based okay. game. And I mean, it says multiplayer, first-person shooter. Maybe that's what Project F is. That's that's what I'm more interested in out of all of this is Project F. If that's something RPG. that's single player, yeah, man. I mean, what other Maybe. genre is out? Is is in there? Say, platformers. Seems like a smart idea for that that lore to translate to like a turn-based RPG. Yeah. That'd be kind of cool. And that'd be the one I'd be interested in, but it would need to give me some backstory for me to really appreciate it because I don't know a thing about League. There are a lot of attractive League of Legends characters I would love to learn more about. Yeah? You would. Just throwing that out there. Hey, look, man. I'm an honest man. (laughs) Uh, So I guess we'll wait for more details on that because they just said 2020. I have no idea if that means early, late. Yeah, no, I know League of Legends doesn't uh doesn't get trip any of our triggers, but it is it's cool that Riot is doing other things. I agree, I agree, and I mean that that game is way more massive than we're giving it credit for. Just because none of us are interested in playing it doesn't isn't mean it, it doesn't have a huge draw with the the community. Isn't it by our count the most played game in the world? Does that beat out Fortnite? I think, or at least a few years. You know what? I heard the statistic before Fortnite came out. So yeah. Yeah, you're right. The world changed after there's pre Fortnite and post Fortnite. Uh, yeah, and now there's pre black hole and post black hole. Man, coming back to last week's oh, news story, chapter two. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see what happens. But uh, in the meantime, let's go ahead and move on to some housekeeping. CB, what is going on with Patreon? Uh, well, we still have our more recent episodes, educational games, and our behind the podcast episode. Uh, other than that, we have recorded our Final Fantasy episode. Uh, and that should be coming up fairly shortly, and we will be recording our Halloween games episode here within this week, and hopefully have that out before, uh, within, I don't know, the next week and a half. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Spoiler alert, I uh, I heard Nate say that uh, Friday the 13th is not nearly as bad as we all think it is. Uh, yeah, we, we wow. definitely have some things to say about it. And then we mm-hmm. also played a uh, horror game that was never released. In PT? The US. No, an NES game that has okay. that has Reebok shoes in it. <laughs> Reebok shoes, really? Yep. So, for those that would like to do some research, you can you can try and figure it out what it is. There you go. And uh, you forgot one episode that is in high demand. Oh yes, the infamous Glee episode. Yeah. So yeah. we'll get, we got to get that together. I know. We don't have a choice. So the gun is to our heads. 
Yep. I'm... Well, not only that, but I think CB is going to tie it into a game as well, aren't you? Yes, we're going to get the Glee Xbox uh, 360 game. Oh my gosh! Is it a karaoke? It has to be. A it is a karaoke game, right? game and we're yeah, going to make Scott sing. Be... <laughs> is it the actual like mixes that they do from the from the show? Because that would actually be kind of cool. I have no idea. We're gonna have to track that I'm just, down. I have I'm just uh, trying access to, imagine, to two microphones. I'm just trying to imagine a Glee game where you have to like listen to like Leah Michelle tell you how to do things. I'm like, <laughs> no, mm. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> well, you're still playing it. Oh, by the way, uh, I was talking to Nate today, and we have a fantastic idea for a Patreon episode, uh, possibly for next month. Remind me to tell you off air because I don't want to announce it here in case you don't like it. Yeah, but I think sure. you're gonna like it. I think you're gonna like it. Probably. Anyway, if any of that content sounds interesting to you and you'd like to help us out over here at The Gaming Outsider, head over to patreon.com forward slash the GoCast. Three bucks a month will get you access to all of our bonus and past content, and it helps us keep the lights on over here at The Gaming Outsider. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the week's topic, or from the outside in topic. The fall season is upon us, which means we're about to be overloaded with a ton of AAA titles that are promising to be high quality, as well as plenty of indie titles that are piquing our interest as well. We thought this would be a good time to take a look at the last quarter of the upcoming games and see which ones we're keeping an eye out for. So before I share the list, though, I want to know what strategy you guys use during this time of year to get in as much gaming as possible. I mean, there's so many titles coming in a short amount of time compared to the rest of the year. And then on top of that, you got holidays that are taking up a lot of your time, or at least they do for me. How do you decide which games to prioritize this time of year? Well, I mean, for me, it's definitely just as they come along, pick them up and take a bite and just keep playing. So luckily I have, I have free time in my life when I'm off work and the kids uh, are at school or daycare and uh, as you you will learn later in this podcast, uh, I just got a game what two days ago and already beat it. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, CB's yeah. a machine. Yeah, we're we're all a little jealous of your time at this point, man. Yeah, I can't talk. I have summers. I wish I could ignore my family the way you do. I well, that's the thing is I don't. <laughs> it's just between between the hours of seven forty five a.m. and three p.m. I have the house to myself. Oh my god, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. Oh, dude, it's it's fantastic. The summer is awesome for me, but even during the school year, my favorite time of day is I get off at 2 o'clock, and then I get to come home, and I have the house to myself for about three hours. And that's nothing against my wife. It's just so nice coming home to a house that's quiet, and I can cry, just do whatever. I can whatever. cry right now. Yeah. The idea oh, is so man. beautiful. Well, it's, it's wonderful for me because with a wife and two kids, just having silence is amazing. Yeah. Zach, I think you and I would have made great roommates. Right, because we'd just be like, all right, I'm just going to play games. Yeah, I'm just going to go in my room and play games for a while. If you feel like coming out and playing something, great. If not, oh well. That is the roommate I dreamed of. Yeah. All my roommates I've ever had the uh, the pleasure of rooming with, they're always like, hey, man, what do you want to do tonight? I'm like, well, I just kind of want to play games. Oh, well, you, you know, the game's on. I'll order some pizza. I'm like, ah, socializing every night. It's exhausting. <laughs> Well, I'm not gonna lie. There, there would be some football if we lived together. Well, but, I understand. I understand. Yeah, but Let's, I would, uh, I wouldn't try to co- coax you to watch it with me. I know you, how you feel about sports. I mean, I'll play the Switch next to you. It'd be kind of cute. Yeah, why not? Yeah, like, man. Now you're making me wish I was about 10, 15 years younger. Right. We could have been roommates. Right. That'd have been awesome. It's all your wife's fault. She snatched you up. Yeah. Yeah. Staff. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Zach? What do you do to? Uh, to, to to prioritize your, your gaming habits during this time of year. Man, I was going to say, it's such a brutal time of year for me because uh, all my Arrowverse shows are on as well. So it's oh, a major, yeah. you know, I got I got, a, I got a different show to watch every night of the week this time of year. Um, But it, it is, it's just, yeah, about you. You you pick the ones you want the most and you just kind of try to barrel through it as fast as you can. You maybe deprioritize socializing or... <laughs> Other hobbies. It sounds so bad saying that that way, but I mean, it's what's important to us, and we're. Yeah, I, I mean, I would. Yeah, I would rather be swinging a lightsaber through Kashyyyk than going out again. Yeah, I think you're a you're a an old soul deep down, man. I really I really think I that. Know. I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, this time of year is rough for me. I mean, CB, you and I were trying to find a date 
to do something here uh, and you know, before the year ended. And we both looked at our calendars, and there was literally not a weekend left in the year that you and I both didn't have something going on. So we had to wind up pushing it back to, what, January? And even then, I don't think we've solidified something. Nope, still down. haven't. I mean, between – December's the worst because – you got, you know, Christmas parties, Christmas with the families. Um, I mean, there's just so much to do. And on top of that, I mean, I know that not all gamers are big sports fans, but Sunday is football day in my house. I mean, I, I mean I'm mean, i usually sitting on my couch with my laptop doing some kind of work for the podcast or playing a game on my Switch or something while football is going on, but football is on. I'm not at a console playing a game on Sunday. During, during the season. This this is actually the the first year for me I have not watched a single football game because I don't have cable TV anymore. Oh, really? I don't have cable either. So, yeah, but I don't want to spend the 40 bucks for Hulu TV. Oh, dude, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Right? We used to like get, get uh, cable every year around football season and then just cancel it, you know, once football season was over. But now I don't have to, you know, do a hassle of returning that hardware to the cable company and all that. I just cancel Hulu when I'm when I'm done with it. It's fantastic. It's great. Yeah, I can see that. Plus, I think the older we get, we tend to go out socializing a lot less. Like people are like, hey, you want to go to the bar? And I'm like, no, no, drinking at home is cheaper. All my friends live in Rockford, so. <laughs> you know, and it is a weird thing of getting old. Like I remember in my tw- early 20s, just going to the bar was what I wanted to do. And I feel like such an old fart saying I just I just don't really. I, I mean, with certain friends, there's a there's a, a few friends that I just really like going to the bar, like CB. You know, I go to Old Chicago every now and then just because we always know they have something different to drink. But I don't know. I, I would rather be doing something, you know, whether it, maybe not even a video game, but just going to the bar, sitting and drinking. No, no pool table, no dartboard, no nothing. Well, I mean, even when you and I go to Old Chicago, we wind up bringing a laptop and still doing things yeah getting stuff done or or bringing business cards past now trying to drum up interest in the podcast we're such sellouts it's ridiculous but as for me it gets very difficult this time of year to plan out Um, i mean even during the school year my only real dedicated day to play games is saturday mornings Uh, I, i get up you know with the sun usually and put on some coffee and sit in my basement and i'm there for the majority of the morning, if not into the afternoon, and that uh, that carries on throughout the throughout the season. But as far as picking games nowadays, it's it's picking ones that I want to want to play to talk about here. I'm finding as I do this more that I'm playing less for myself, 100. I mean, I try to pick games that I want to do, but I've been playing a game this week that I really didn't want to, and I kept playing it some more. And I would text Zach and swear like a sailor. <laughs> I'm still playing this game, and I got this other one I want to play instead. Never seen Scott so angry. Oh man, yeah, I was. The, oh, the phone calls have been great. <laughs> oh, you get phone calls. Yeah. Well, I ah. I call him, and he'll be like, "What are you doing? Um, I'm playing this game. I really don't like it. I hate it. This <laughs> game is stupid, and it just escalates into just ridiculous. Devolves into madness. Yeah." Well, you know, we we got to finish games. It's, I feel guilty if I don't finish a game that we're we're reviewing. So, it and it's and it's awful when you're trying to get through it as quickly as possible because you know you want to play something else, and a game just keeps you from progressing. Like it's like actively trying to make you take a long time to get through it. It drives me crazy. But I, I will uh, definitely say with this season coming up, where you'll have like two or three AAA titles drop in a week. Uh, one, one would definitely take precedence over another. And the unfortunate thing is like, Oh, next week I I wanted to play this more than those two from last week. And those get pushed back. And well, and here's where I'm at. I've got some games in my backlog that are going to prioritize some of the games actually coming out. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got to play control before the end of the year. Yes. Yes. And, uh, but, but there's a couple that I just have to play as well. There's, and we'll get to the list here in a second, but there's a couple that I'm more curious about than just have to get my hands on. Uh, so I'll probably, like, the one, you know, I'm thinking of, I'm probably going to let Zach play and uh, see what he thinks about it before I decide if I'm going to play it. But um, I don't know. I, I was looking at the list, and I feel like this year isn't nearly as 
as crowded as it was last year and the year before. Am I wrong in that? Is there just... Uh, I'll disagree. There's a few. Really? Okay. Still well, feels it, crowded. Yeah. It's, it's crowded mean, it, because of the types of games that they are with the length required to play through them. That's fair. Or maybe it's just games that appeal to you a little less, Scott. I think that's what it might be because I was looking through the list and I, and I didn't write every game coming out, obviously, because we don't have that kind of time. I just tried to get the ones that were that were standouts or ones that I was personally interested in. Here's a list. Let's just go ahead and read it. We got Call of Duty Modern Warfare, which is actually next week, I believe. No, uh, it's Medieval. this week. Is it this week? Jeez, three days. Uh, Medieval, uh, Luigi's Mansion 3, Need for Speed Heat, Death Stranding, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Pokemon Sword, Pokemon Shield, Shenmue 3, Terminator Resistance, Shovel Knight King of Cards, Biomutant, and I love that CB added Tunic on here. I assume that's CB that added that. Yep. We haven't heard anything about that game in two years, and we were all stoked for it. Where is Tunic? So um, what do you think, Zach? What, uh, which ones are you most looking forward to here? It's got to be Star Wars, right? It's, it's got to be. It's got to be. Uh, you know what? Hey, let me just top it off with Jerror45. Jer Hard overlook the new Star Wars game after that IGN preview. I'll be watching the reviews pretty closely for that. Also, Death Stranding is too crazy not to pay attention to. He's right on both fronts. Yeah, did you know that people have already got uh, their hands on Death Stranding? Like review copies are out in the wild? Yes, it's been uh, hard to miss. You know, we do not have a Sony contact because they don't, they don't lie. They don't play ball with us, I guess. Well, I'm, I'm just not that good at my job. I've, <laughs> I try weekly to try to get some contact with Sony. Yeah, it's a tough nut uh, to crack. But. Yes, but regardless, yeah, I think I think Star Wars. The more they say about Star Wars, the more it sounds like they're talking dirty to me. Yeah, they're like they're like, hey, it's gonna have, it's got that uh, Bloodborne combat. It's got that uh, you know open Arkham City kind of exploration here. Uh, we 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 deconstructed Metroid Prime beat for beat to yeah, uh, now, get the pacing perfected. Now you're talking to my now you're talking to my heart right there. We got we got lightsabers in here. We got uh, di the dynamic difficulties. Uh, we got you know use your old skills come back. Oh, it also it has several planets, not just one. Uh, yeah. So here's a perfect video game right here. Oh, it's so in the respawn. The developers of Titanfall. Yeah, is there anything negative about this game in your book at this point? It's to say, other than I think the main character looks a, seems a little flat, but otherwise, I'm on board. Yeah, yeah, good call. It's, yeah, man. Yeah, that game looks insane. Uh, and also, uh, personally, Shenmue 3 is a big, big deal for me. I think you're the only one on our team that's stoked about that one. No, 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 I take it back. I think Chad likes Shenmue, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've had that thing. I, you know, I was part of the Kickstarter, so I, am, uh, I guess I have bias or whatever. I have financial involvement in Shenmue 3's success. Right. That's true. But it is, uh, I mean, it's just a story I never thought I would see continue. And it's just a, it's a darn shame it's coming out four days after Star Wars. <laughs> That's going to be put on the back burner for sure. Yeah, I, I feel like, well, I was like, oh, man, which one, should I, which one should I prioritize? I'm like, you know what? I've been waiting over a decade for Shenmue 3. I can wait a couple more days. Fair enough. Yeah, so, but then uh, before we pass it along to CB, Two Finger Tuesday ranked theirs. One, Fallen Order. Two, Luigi's Mansion. Three, Modern Warfare. Four, Death Stranding. Yeah, I think Death Stranding looks incredible as well, by the way. I'm in, I've been one of the podcasts I listen to that's been playing it. You know, they do the whole like, well, we can't talk about it, but right. they mm -hmm. heavily hinted that uh, it sounds like a game that is doing things differently, that yeah, is trying have, new things. I have, uh, it's one of the rare things in life where I'm intentionally not watching anything. So you're definitely going to play it. Yeah, with that, I will, I will be there day <sighs> one. I'm so curious, but I'm so I could have, apprehensive. I could have not seen a single trailer for this thing, and they're just like, hey, it's your Kojima's next game. I'm like, all right, here's $60. Fair enough. CB, what about you? Uh, well, I mean, for me, the biggest ones kind of got pushed back. So You know what? I am so happy yes. that Doom Eternal <laughs> got pushed back. Yes, Doom, Doom Eternal getting pushed back was kind of a godsend. Yeah, it was it was coming out the same day as Star Wars. Yeah. So that was I, I actually feel that that was a good move on their part. Yeah, it's good for everybody. So we, we don't want another Titanfall 2 debacle. Right. Uh ain't, no, ain't nothing gonna cannibalize your sales quite like Star Wars is gonna cannibalize your sales. Yes. 
So having that move back and then the fact that Cyberpunk is not till like April 2020 April, yep. is pretty glorious. But yeah, Mod- Modern Warfare 2 was definitely up there on my list. Luckily, I know that that game is a not a long campaign. Did so. you say Modern Warfare 2? Hey, Modern Warfare. Brain <laughs> fart. Modern Warfare 4. Yes. <laughs> so Mod- Modern Warfare will, it's a shorter campaign, so I, I don't feel so bad about that. But yeah, uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order is definitely probably my number one. Uh, Modern Warfare number two, and then I think I'm actually going to be teaming up with Nate, and he's playing Pokemon Sword, and I'm playing Pokemon Shield. Oh, you guys are little buddies. Yep. So, it's Packy Man. Don't steal them from me, Nate. Pa- no, I'm sorry. Packy Mans. Just word it out. Um, <laughs> but uh, Quentin uh, Theodens, uh, I'm looking forward to Jedi Fallen Order the most. The game seems to be in the same vein as the Jedi Knight series. Uh, the Force Unleashed, and the canceled 1313 game. Uh, I have high hopes that EA redeems themselves with this game. Uh, what we've seen thus far, I think it will be great. Because I will tell you right now, if EA does not produce on this, I'm just never going to buy another Star Wars game until they lose the rights. Oh, hey, and Prince of Persia platforming, also in Jedi Fallen Order. That's Sorry. true. They're just, they got all the buzzwords I had ever needed. Yeah, I really have a hard time believing that this game is going to fail. I, I mean, just like yeah. you said, Zach, everything about this game just sounds like it's going to be great. Well, the, the only thing it's lacking is originality, but I really don't need it. Not in Star Wars, no. No, I mean, it's just like, if you're going to put together all the best pieces of all the best games, I don't need you to have an original idea. Yeah. I agree. Well, that's what I'm saying. If if this game is somehow a punt, I, I will definitely not pick up another Star Wars game until EA loses the license. I can't see Respawn making a mediocre game. That's that's a big thing I was going to say too. Yeah. I'm 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 still apprehensive, okay? I I no, I understand especially yeah, EA behind it. When, when was the last time we got just a complete single player Star Wars game? A long time Force ago. Unleashed 2? Force yes. Unleashed 2, yeah. Yeah, that's insane. So, I'm like I said, I'm I'm a bit apprehensive. So, I I really wish 1313 would have came out. I was really yes. looking forward to that. Oh, my God. The Boba Fett Uncharted game. Mm-hmm. What more did you need in life? So, but I, I definitely am also looking forward to the Medieval game. Oh, interesting. I, so. I, was, I was interested in the remake until I played the demo. I was like, oh, this is not as good as I remember. Well, I, I want to try it because I did like the original, so, but... I do... A fondness for the original. Uh, De- Death Stranding has also been pre-ordered, so I will be playing that as well. It's Digital? just like, what is that game, you know? that That's kind of what I'm curious. I mean, all and unfortunately, almost every time things get pushed back, it's always the PS4 games. Like, I still have not played more than two hours of God of War. So... Boy. <laughs> um, I have a feeling... I. Man, I haven't even played more than six hours of Metal Gear Five. What about Spider Man? Okay, that well, that's that's uh that's different. An exception to every rule. <laughs> I, There's one that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, Samuel Smith here said first and foremost, Outer Worlds, uh, then Jedi oh, yeah. and and uh, Death Stranding. Death Stranding more out of pure curiosity than later down the road. Just after the New Year, The Last of Us Two and Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, those are my most anticipated upcoming games. I'm so excited. That's one hell of a lineup of games. And I should apologize because I put a bunch of images for this uh, this question on Facebook and Twitter and everything. And I included Cyberpunk 2077 before I remembered that that did get pushed back to April. So uh, those two are next year. But Outer Worlds is another one that I feel like I have a, a better idea about what that game is than Death Stranding. But uh, it's the people. It's it's uh, Obsidian, correct? It's- Yes. Fallout, yep. yeah. Fallout. Fallout New Vegas in space. Yeah, that, that gets me really intrigued. And that's coming to Game Pass, is it not? Also this week. Snap, you're right. Whoa, I didn't even think about the fact that it'd be on Game Pass. I was like, oh, does it fit in the budget? You know what? It sure does. It sure does. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that's, and that's oh, man, another can, one that, that I'm I keep gonna give hearing. Up, I'm going to give up trophies to play an Xbox game. Look Whoa. at you. Hey. That's not. That's, see, that's dangerous. See, that's dangerous for so- Sony. Oh, but I'm I'm very very excited for Outer Worlds. My worry with that one is the time sink because you know that's going to be a long game, very long. Yeah, game. 
Because that's like what gives you about 10 days to get through it before Death Stranding comes out. Right, right. And where you'll have another 10 or so days to get through it before Jedi Fallen Order comes out. <laughs> well, man, I mean, look at March and April are just going to be crazy for 2020. Like, it's just... It's... I'm so... I'm almost happy Cyberpunk doesn't look good to me at all. Yeah? I get to save myself about 200 hours. I'm not, I'm not completely turned off by it yet. I just, I feel like I need to see more. Keanu Reeves is a big selling point for me. Not going to lie. I think that's, that's why they put him in there, Scott. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I had to throw this comment in here from Michael Bonovich. He said, after Final Fantasy 15, I may do Dishonored 2 or Deus Ex Mankind Divided. So what is the future like? Uh, Michael talked to, I think, on the last episode that he is constantly just working on his backlog, which, honestly, it's a smart way to do it. Games are a lot cheaper. You don't have a time crunch, so uh, more power to you, do, man. Do Deus Ex, man. That's uh, my I recommendation. Have, I, have, I think I still have a copy of that game. I got it for five bucks out of a Redbox machine. Oh, yeah. oh that's a sequel one, right? Mankind Divided. Yep. Because mm-hmm. Human Revolution was a reboot. Okay. Yep. Never played Mankind Divided, but boy, Human Revolution was great. And I think Dishonored 2 is on sale on Xbox right now for 10 bucks, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, too. So I actually for that. picked up Dishonored 2 at uh, Disc Replay for like $8. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a physical hmm. copy. There you go. Also, Sean Coates said, I'm actually looking forward to Terminator Resistance. It was such a surprise announcement, and it looks like everything I'd want in a single-player Terminator game. The cherry on the top is that it's coming out in December, which is awesome. Uh, Shenmue 3 is another one I'm really looking forward to. Terminator just came out of nowhere. And... I forgot. Yeah? When it, when you were reading this comment, I thought it was a joke about the Terminator Salvation tie-in game. I actually like that game, man. I did, too. I did, too. Was, that was the one that felt a lot like when you shot the Terminators, like pieces of them fell off. Yeah. It felt it this, really cool. The same the same team that made that really good Wanted game? Wanted, and uh, oh, what was the other one? There was a, there was an Android game. Bionic Commando. No, that's not the one I'm thinking of. Maybe yeah, it's not the same developer. But there was another game that I played around that era that was on 360 that was, it was two words, um, something, Protocol maybe? No, 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 that was Deus Ex. Yeah, no, 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 Alpha, Alpha, Protocol. Alpha Protocol was, that's not the one I'm thinking of. But it was one where you were you were fighting hordes of these robots that like pieces and springs would fly off. Binary and, Domain. Thank you. That's what it was. Binary uh, binary Domain. That was a great yeah. sleeper game for me. That was an awesome game for the developers yeah. of Yakuza. Of all there things. we go. There we go. Yeah. Uh, another one that I'm looking forward to that we didn't mention even in the list is this game called After Party. That's on PC and Xbox. It's made by the people that made... Um, Oh, what's the name of that game you like on on Xbox CB? That's a uh, um, it's like a choose your own adventure one with the kids. That's like supernatural stuff going on. It starts with an O. Um, uh, Oxen free. Oxen free. Thank you. It's made by the people that did Oxen Free, but after party. This is a fun game we're playing, Scott. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, you can't remember the name, and I get all these clues. I'm like, oh, what is it? <laughs> we should have, we should have a trivia episode again. That would be that'd be a blast. No, but after party is it's a similar vein where it's not like an action game. It's very much dialogue heavy puzzles or whatever. But uh, you play as a character that dies and goes to hell, and uh, the basically competes against the devil in a drinking contest. I forgot oh, yes. about this game. That I. Because you and I were talking about it. That game actually does look really funny. It looks hilarious. They actually had that one at the ID at Xbox booth at E3 when I was there. I didn't get a chance to play it, but it looked it looked outstanding. So, And uh, pretty cool developers as well, too. So, yeah. Those are it. I, I would like to play uh, The Shovel Knight, King of Cards. I haven't played those games in a while, so I feel like I would definitely need a refresher and kind of go back and relearn those games. But the beauty of those extra games is they each play kind of differently so you get to kind of relearn it anyway so it'd probably be okay but yeah i i, don't know. I, I do want to play the modern warfare campaign pretty heavily so do i it, it looks uh, very very old school modern warfare with fresh graphics yeah and then and the i know the things they're saying are turning off a lot of people or like they're intentionally trying to be controversial that uh, that appeals to me in a big way though yeah i can see that too so. God forbid we're reminded that war is bad. Right. I got to ask, too, because I've seen the trailer on TV a couple times. The character with, like, the the old-timey steamboat it's mustache. Price. Is yeah. that Price? Okay. It's got to be, right? I, I, I assume, but it looked like it sounded like him, but I wasn't 100% sure, and I, I couldn't remember. So. <laughs> price that, or uh, soap. I mean. Or soap, be, yeah. Yeah, soap's got to make an appearance, right? I like how we are attached to these characters somehow. So I mean, it's that's all you know. Got to know is it's is it price or is it soap? So 
They did but that, I mean, uh, those are campaigns I only played through once, and those campaigns were like six or seven hours, and I still remember the characters that well. That that says something yeah. about that. Well, I mean, those campaigns are so great because you know every forty minutes or something, like something significant happens that right. sticks with you. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool. They do not make games of that campaign kind of. They do not make games of that pace anymore. I agree, and I I feel like as weird as it sounds. That Modern Warfare, the, where the first one where the nuke went off, was one of the first experiences in modern gaming where I got like a pit in my stomach, like, holy cow, this is happening. Like, it, it just the sense of dread, because at the time it was so realistic and it just felt like a real world. It wasn't like a fantasy world where, you know, oh, yeah, this, this realm full of magic is now destroyed. Now, this was like in our backyard. And yeah, I was, you know, at, uh, in Modern Warfare 2, it always stuck with me when you get betrayed by. Uh, Shepherd or whatever, and you you but you play as a character dying in first person, like slowly bleeding out from a gunshot wound. Yeah, that was pretty. That's uh, hard to forget. Yeah, some that I mean the storytelling. No Russian. Yeah, no Russian. the storytelling in those is great. I mean, I actually as as bad as the game was, I really enjoyed the storytelling from like Homefront. Like, oh, I did yeah. too. Like that was great. The gameplay was flawed, but so I mean, I'm oh, those moments where you're hiding amongst all the other dead bodies. Oh yeah, or like being yeah. shoveled with like a with like a front end loader. Like holy cow, that was that was jarring. Luckily, I know that the campaign is going to be short. The multiplayer, I don't, I don't really care beyond that. Yeah, I'll I'll dabble in it, but so I mean, though it is a triple A title, it's going to be a, a quick one, and I know I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah, red box rental yeah, for the win. I would be excited for Biomutant, but I do not believe it is coming out this year. I don't think it is either. No, they keep they, yeah they have they haven't pushed it back, but they keep just saying 2019, and I, they've you've run out of dates. <laughs> at, at this point, where where are you going to stick it? Yeah, I just, there's no there's no yeah. comfortable place for that game to come out. So is it fair to say that uh, Fallen Order is our collective most anticipated game? Yes. Yeah, I have a feeling we're all going to love that game. Yeah, very looking I forward would be, to that. I, I I scanned through that IGN footage that Jero was talking about. Jero forty five was talking about. And there's like a big old brutish guy with a lightsaber, like a boss fight. I was like, man, I never knew how much I needed Star Wars Dark Souls in my life. Well, and and I'm not even a big Dark Souls guy. I mean, I can dabble, but if and even I'm like, hey, maybe this one will will turn me on to that style of gameplay and and get me back. Right. Into what's it. What's good about it is that, like the standard difficulty is. It's not designed to crush your spirits like mm-hmm. Dark Souls, but they do have a difficulty for that if you're used to the that kind of combat. Like I think that's really cool. Is that what you're gonna do? Crank it up right off the off the get go? Yeah, I don't know. Did you did you read any of the previews about the difficulty settings? I don't know how nerdy that is. No, I, I I've kind of avoided it. Like I know you were talking like with Death Stranding, you're actively avoiding. I'm kind of to that point with Fallen Order, just because I want to. I kind of want to go into that fresh now. Okay. Well, it's just. Uh, on like so on normal difficulty, it's whatever the standard is. But then on harder, like there are attacks you won't see on normal difficulty for enemies. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Like, so yeah, they have like a whole different combat mechanics. The boss fights will play out differently because of that. It's more, it's more of for like the fans of those Souls like games. That's more interesting than just increasing the health bar. Yeah, they said that was the first rule of difficulty was that none, of, none of the at no difficulty does the amount of health change. Oh wow! The enemies, yeah. So they actually made it like actually harder. I think you do take more damage on the higher ones, but the right. enemies you can still one shot a stormtrooper on the hardest difficulty. I like it. That's like super it. cool. That's that's really making it matter. I like it. Well, thanks to everybody that wrote in and told us their uh, favorite titles they're looking for. Stay tuned for next week. We're going to be talking about independent developers next week, and we're going to have a special guest to join us for that. So stay tuned for that. And then following the week after that's going to be our uh, community questions episode. So get those questions ready, video game related or not. In the meantime, we want to say hello to some new Facebook members. If you haven't already joined our group, you can do so over at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the GoCast. Our newest members are Ryan Mitchell, RJ Kuligowski, and Donald McCune, welcome over there. Uh, no new Discord members, but if you're interested in joining another route to have some good conversations about games, find the link in our show notes for our Discord server. Got a great community over there as well. 
Also, our website, thegamingoutsider.com, is where we put our written reviews. We've got our uh, Bob's review of Greedfall is available on there, as well as Spencer's review of John Wick Hex. We talked about those in past episodes. And my written review of A King's Quest is uh, also will also be available, as well as CB's review of Ghostbusters, the video game remastered. And he's also got a written review of a uh, gaming backpack that we got our hands on that uh, those should be up there by the time you hear this episode as well. With that, let's go ahead and jump into the games we've actually been playing. All right, Zach, what's uh, new on the horizon for the following week? Well, as with all weeks following, it's a big week. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much downward spiral at this point. Right off the bat, uh, this game, Moons of Madness on PS4, Xbox One, and PC, October 22nd. This trailer gave me heavy Dead Space vibes. Yeah, this may be my Halloween game of choice. Yeah, this thing looks rad. Space Thulu. It is very much faith. Yeah, that's that's fun. Yeah, Cthulhu. I just, uh, I like the sci-fi and horror. It's a hell of a combination. I agree. I know CB does. He's the biggest alien fan I know. I, I may or may not be playing this tomorrow, so. <laughs> wow, that'd be kind of cool if we all did. Yeah. Uh, then uh, the JRPG franchise that seems to have three releases a year, The Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel 3 on PS4, October 22nd. I've always wanted to play these games. Uh, WWE 2K20 comes out on PS4, Xbox One, and PC also on the 22nd. That game looks miserable. <laughs> uh, like, not even... like as a. Even as a non wrestling guy, it's like it just looks it just looks bad. It looks like they don't care. I don't think I've played a wrestling game since like the WWF games in arcade back in the early nineties. Oh, the N sixty four games were sick. Yeah. Uh then uh we got Lonely Mountains Downhill, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, PC, Mac, and Linux. All on October twenty third. <laughs> it's notable for Linux. Cat Quest, Cat Quest 2 comes out of the Apple Arcade and onto the Nintendo Switch October 23rd. Uh, Captain, Captain Price saves the world in Call of Duty Modern Warfare, PS4, Xbox One, PC, October 25th. Yeah, Daniel Fortescue returns in Medieval, PS4, Xbox, October 25th. And then uh, The Outer Worlds, which I just recently realized will be almost free, is coming uh PS4, Xbox One, and PC on October 25th. What yeah. is tripping your trigger, catching your fancy? What's doing it for you guys? Well, I always like to play some kind of horrific game during this season. I uh, had toyed around with going back to Dead Space 2 because I did uh, Dead Space 1 last year. But uh, considering I have all the achievements on that, I might just uh, go do Moons of Madness instead. But do both. I'm also going to play why, Outer why, Worlds. Why restrain yourself? Because of time, man. Oh, yeah, I guess there is that. Dead Space 2 is so good, though. It really is. And that's what, it's like 12 hour of, game, maybe? Yeah, at the most. It's it's yeah. one of the great horror games. Agreed. Man, that moment on the Ishimura. Ah. Uh, mm. So when you say this moment of Dead Space 2, I think about five different things. Right. But when you go back. No, yeah, there's no. Yeah. There's no question. That is an incredible scene. Oh, so good for so many reasons. Loved it. And the needle. Oh, the needle. And I had to play through that game like four times to get all the achievements, and each time it still was like, ugh. I love it. Did you get the, you even got the achievement for doing the whole game in one, like with three saves or whatever? I believe so, yeah. I mean, if you got a thousand out of a thousand, you would have had to have, but. I would have to go back and double check, but uh, I was very adamant about getting all of the, no, you know what, I think I did miss that one. It's just, it's just, that's a stupid achievement, I'm sorry. I love, I loved it. I love that chase. It, it's not. It's not a difficulty thing. It's a time management thing. No, it is. Yeah, yeah. you get three saves though. You just got to time it. Come yeah. on, man. Everyone wants Peng. Oh, the Peng was always fun. Like it's like in a random place. What That's about you, CB? Uh, well, I will obviously be playing Space Thulu tomorrow. Uh, I like that we're all excited about that. It just yeah. kind of, you know like kind of a kind of a smaller game. This it's cool. This is definitely like the hardest week for me though because. Moons of Madness, Call of Duty, Medieval, and The Outer Worlds. Like, oh. You got to divide and conquer here, guys? Well, I think we're all going to play The Outer Worlds because it would be silly not to. Yeah. Because yeah. it's not costing us a thing. 
I will definitely say, hopefully, depending on how long Moons of Madness is, I'll have that done before the other three release. Medieval's just going to have it done before. Back. But he's gonna have it done. He's gonna have it done before we finish recording this podcast. <laughs> but but like Call of Duty, like we know it's gonna be a ten hour or less um, campaign. So, I hope so I I'm gonna probably breeze through that and then just crank into the outer worlds. Nice. Yeah, I always forget you can rent games because I don't want to buy Water Modern Warfare at all. No, but I do want to blast through that campaign. Are you going to buy it, CB? I may rent it. Yeah. That's a rental for me, too. Just I wish I could get into Legend of Heroes, but it's just... Uh, That's a time sink. Well, It is a time sink, and it's also... I don't know, it's always, it's always seemed like a cool franchise, that's all. Mm-hmm. Well, I have Trials of Cold Steel 1, if you ever want to borrow it. I may. I, I have one of the Legend of, Hero, Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky I have on PS Vita. But they and they all like there's like nine games that all form like one massive series. Actually, I have Cold Steel cool. one and two on Vita. Yeah, and you haven't played them at all, have you? Nope. It's cool. Trails in the Sky, like it's every trilogy is a different nation of a warring continent. Oh, well, that's kind of cool. So you see it from all perspectives, and they give each a whole trilogy, which is an insane amount of time. So you in one game you hate the enemy, and then in the other game you end up hating the people you're playing as. Apparently, like that sounds cool as hell. What a fun twist! Anyway, the know. Outer Worlds looks like the best game on this list. Yeah, you're probably right. I'm just scared of the time. Uh, it's, yeah, it's Obsidian. You know, it's gonna be a long game. There, man. I'm so happy that's on Game Pass. <laughs> I love that. I'm because we made your day, man. No, that's yeah. It really does be because I was so intimidated by the time sink. I was like, oh, wait, you know, I'm like, I'm talking myself out of. Like, do I have the money? Oh, it's going to take so much time to play anyway. But now I'm like, oh, hey, I can just dip my toes into it and then probably be enraptured and put 30 hours into it over the weekend. I believe you can like already it. pre-download it, too. So That's the first thing I'm doing when I get out of here with you fools. Same here. I've already done it. <laughs> have you? No surprise yep. there. He's probably going to tank the podcast with his internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. Don't ever forget, guys, we have the trailers in the show notes every single week, so be sure to click there, check out these things, check out that trailer for Moons of Madness. I think you'll be surprised at how cool that looks. Agreed. But also, Scott. Yes, sir. You've been playing a Game of the Year contender, Children of Morda. Oh, man. Not to give, not to give away the ga- goose before the gander. No, 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 that's fine. Uh, I mean, it, it, I think I said that to you over text, that uh, Children of Morta is going to be a contender for me. And a lot of that is, you know, I've only played it for, I want to say six or seven hours, but you, you ever play a game and within the first half hour, you're just like, yep, this is a game that's made for me. I am absolutely in love with Children of Morta. It's the game that I am thinking about at work that I wish I had time to play. This is the game that's making me wish I had Project X Cloud so I could be playing this all the time because it's just short little bursts and runs. I. I love it. Um, so what would you like to know? It's a roguelike. It is. Uh, if you imagine that if Diablo were a roguelike, like Rogue Legacy. Oh, it's Scott Clark crack. Pretty much. Very much so. Uh, it, it, it plays very much like a Diablo, but it's not uh, graphically as intensive as a Diablo. The, the character models are very pixelated. Um, Do you ever play, um, I think it was a phone game, Swords and Sorcery? Or something like that, where it was it was a very um, oh, audio heavy game. Yeah, it was like a yeah, Sword and Sorcery EP. Something like Brother. There's yeah. Brothers was in the title. It it looks like that, like a slightly better version of that. Uh, but uh, what's interesting is you've got multiple different characters that you can choose from. You only start with one, and that's what I think you would actually like about this, Zach, because we've talked in the past about how you kind of like the gameplay of say like a Binding of Isaac. But you were just so turned off by the by the poop jokes. There's a lot of poop in those games. There's a lot of poop in those games. This is very much a uh, a story driven, poopless version of of a uh, um, Binding of Isaac, more serious. And the storytelling is really great. It does something that I've never seen in a, in a roguelike, in that it actually tells a story 
as you go along. So CB, like you love Dead Cells, right? Yes, very much so. There's barely a story in that game. As good as that game is, it's just go through the levels and get as far as you can, fight a boss and kill it, right? So how does, is there, yeah, okay. I, yeah, I mean, uh, how does a roguelite, roguelike story work? Because the, the idea has a hell, a hell of a lot of appeal. Okay, so what, what they do is they, the story starts out is you are this family, and and the family is is overcome with this this darkness that is taking over the world, and the way that they fight against it is to go into the dungeons uh, to try to to try to fight it off. And as you go through the dungeon as a character, which are randomly generated, every so often you'll encounter randomly on the in the dungeon some story beat. Just very, very minor story beat. Like you may come across a sister that is under attack and you fight off all the enemies that are that are attacking her and then she disappears through a portal and you finish your run. Then you either beat that dungeon or you die and you wind up back at the at the house. As soon as you get back to the house, there's a story trailer. Or not a story trailer, but like a, a story beat that's told with the pixelated graphics, but it is narrated beautifully. I mean, this game starts out um, not quite as good as Bastion, but you remember how in Bastion that narrator was constantly talking about like, the, the yeah. kid just rages for a while. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah, you just like walk forward and it's like the kid moved on. They don't do nearly as much talking as as that, but the the narrator's voice w- reminded me very much of that. It's very soft spoken and very deliberate, and it was telling this story. There's just like an an ounce of sadness in his voice with everything that he says. Really gives you a sense of dread in this world. And and no matter what run I'm doing, every two or three runs, I just come across something randomly in this dungeon that just opens up some new story beat that will introduce me to a new member of the family that I now have as a playable character if I want to. Um, or it just may open up extra story beats and you learn about the family and you learn all this lore about the family as you go through. I've never seen that in a roguelike before. No, and I think it, you, you're, you're selling me on a roguelike. Oh man, it's so good. But but that's not even the best part. The progression in this game is so satisfying. When you start out, you feel weak as hell, which it took me, a, like I said, a half an hour to really get its hooks into me because it you can barely do anything at this. But as long as you get some gold and you bring it back and you get some of your stats, you start feeling a little bit better, a little bit better, much like you do in Rogue Legacy. But the best part is that when you're introduced to new characters, the first one I was introduced to is a sister that uh, is a ranged character because the, the first character is, is only melee. And she has like a bow and arrow that has a, a push and pull mechanic in that she can't walk and shoot at the same time for very long before she runs out of stamina. And I didn't like that. I was like, man, I just really don't like this character. But the way that they force you out of your comfort zone with this game is the leveling system. Each character has its own skill tree, which I know you don't like skill trees, but I think it really works in this one in an interesting oh, I, way. I don't like useless skill trees. This is yeah. a great skill tree. Okay. Uh, it's not overly complicated, but each each level of the skill tree has has abilities for your specific character, but it also unlocks family traits, which filter down to all of the other family members as well. So you may get like a health boost that makes every single character's abilities go up, or it may make their movement speed go up, or whatever it is. And the reason that this that incentivizes you to play out of your comfort zone and play with these characters that you normally wouldn't like, because those lower tier family traits are easier to get to because the grind isn't as long. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Yeah. So that is fascinating to me because I started playing with this sister character that I did not like when I started because she was a weak character when she started. And now that I've played with her, she's become one of my favorite characters to play with. And it's Oh man, that sounds sounds awesome. It's really good. And then the uh I, I the only other character I've got is a little brother that uh, has these very quickly she, he wields these short knives very very quickly and he runs fast. So every character has like something going on that makes them completely different from the other playable characters in the story that just works really well and makes me want to keep coming back and back. It is the epitome of a I'll just do one more run kind of game yeah. that I just I just can't get enough of. And the fact that they pepper in these story beats in there as well that are genuinely interesting and I can't wait to see where I'm going, I feel like I'm going to be playing this one for a long time because I've only finished one dungeon 
after about six or seven hours. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Right, because you like you love playing it. You want I love playing it. it, and even though I'm not getting through dungeons, I'm still progressing my characters and building the family and opening more things at the house. And there's always something to unlock. Uh, it, it's the it's one of those games where even when you die, it doesn't feel like a failure because everything that you collected helps you towards your next run in some way, and the, satisfying. Like uh, you've talked me into these roguelikes before, Scott. And I always get mad at you for it. Like Dead Cells or something like that, but did you not like Dead Cells? No, I did. I did not. Uh, I liked. I liked it for like two hours, and I just. I don't like that you never feel like you're doing something, but w- with having like a narrative thread that's mm-hmm. running through each re- like respawn or whatever. Yeah, like that has a, that has so much appeal to me that like I. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to oversell it as like a a very deep story. You're you're mm-hmm. getting little nuggets of a story. Right, but I think that's like a fun way to to make a roguelike. So it feels like you're getting a little bit of something story wise, right. right? You know, like the, the idea sounds cool. And I'm surprised, it's, I'm surprised it took somebody this long to try to integrate story into the roguelike. Like I this. agree 100%. I was, I was like, where has this been this whole time? I mean, I, I mean, I feel like the roguelikes started out as, as just pure gameplay. And finally, somebody has cracked that nut and made the story more interesting than just an intro video or, you know, some, some cheap dialogue at a boss fight or something. Uh, this is this is solid, and I'm I'm really digging it. I will I will definitely say I'm a lot more interested in this now after hearing you talk about it because every time you've recommended a roguelike to me, I've loved them. Moonlight mm-hmm. like Moonlighter, Rogue Legacy, Dead Cells. Oh yeah, see, there's another one, Scott. You made me buy Moonlighter, and I didn't like it at all. Oh my god, you I like s- Moonlighter. I still I'm play sorry. Moonlighter. Sorry guys, sorry. Man, no, that- I didn't like it. Moonlighter was in my top. Well, I, and I don't want to oversell it now, but but I feel like if you were going to try a roguelike, Zach, this is the one. If you don't like this one, I just think roguelikes aren't for you. Because yeah, I mean, this one's like definitely more narrative driven. Point. It's not easy, though. I mean, it, you're gonna. It, it's a it's a dungeon crawler that you're gonna have to be deliberate and patient as you work your way through. You can't just mash your way through it. But what's awesome too is as you go through the dungeons. You'll you'll come across these obelisks. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. That in, that may temporarily increase a stat. So it's got that that roguelike element in that every run is going to feel different because you never know what you're going to come across. That's what Binding of Isaac did so well. But Binding of Isaac had hundreds and hundreds of different um, items, which could make even could make millions of different permutations, so that each run felt different. This one isn't quite as complex as that, but each run still, you, you get a combination that just works and it feels great, and that's the beauty of roguelikes. So Children of Morta, if you like games like Rogue Legacy, Moonlighter, Dead Cells, if those games are your bag at all, uh, this one does something different narratively that I highly recommend, and uh, it's, it, I, I have a feeling this is going to be in my top 10. But I'm also very early. Even more impetus for us to have to play it. I agree. I agree. I'll have to give it a whirl. So, uh, Scott, I know you were uh, also diving into a new Jackbox game. Yes, Jackbox Party Pack 6. Can you believe that these games are up to six packs now? Yes. Which, if there's, if there's five in each, that means there's 36 different Jackbox games, technically, if you look at it that way. And well, uh, I think... I think every time you sneeze, a new Jackbox game gets made. So. I mean, they're once a year. It's not like they're every month or something like that. But, uh, man, I love these games because these are games that... I have, a, I have a group of friends that flirt with gaming. They don't, they don't really play nearly as much as we do. And, you know, they, they don't like twitchy-style games. But these are more like a video game equivalent of a board game, and they just work so well. The first game is Trivia Murder Party. Which CB, I know you. I'm sorry, Trivia Murder Party Two. I know you played the original Trivia Murder Party on uh, Jackbox Party Pack Five and loved it, right? It was hands down probably one of my favorite games they've done so far. Okay, if you like that, you're going to love Trivia Murder Party Two. I felt Trivia Murder Party One was was uh, was good. I didn't think it was great. This one is great. They've taken that formula and expanded on it and made it so much fun. Made it funny. Some genuinely fun puzzle games too. There's one where there's a ghost story that there's an old woman that died and there's a screen that pops up that has like a mirror that's fogged up. 
and the ghost writes a word in the mirror. And then one player has to look at the handwriting and recognize the handwriting. And then everybody else also writes on the tablet after it's cleared. And uh, the player has to guess which one is the same handwriting as the previous ghost. So it's just interesting that you actually have to memorize a handwriting style and then everybody else tries to write like that handwriting style and the player has to guess which one was actually the ghost and not the players. It's just stuff like that that is just so clever that uh, I found really great. Uh, Dictionarium is another game on there that plays, it's kind of like Balderdash, you know, where they give you a nonsense word and everybody has to um, make up their own definition of it. They expand on that a little bit in a fun way, which is kind of cool. Joke Boat is, uh, if you played the last one, CBD, you, if you played five, you remember the one where it was like a rap battle? Oh, man, I love the rap battle. Robot rap battle. The rap battle, battle one was... The robot rap battle one was great. Joke boat is kind of like that, but it's stand up comedy. So they give you the setup of a joke, and then you have to write the punchline. Okay. And then it, and then everybody, everybody, uh, you know, votes on the ones that they think are the best, and it and it works really great. Push the button was probably my second favorite one on this one because it took us a couple rounds to really understand what this is. But if you ever played a party game like Mafia or Werewolves where somebody is the killer or somebody is the werewolf and it's everybody's job to try to figure out who that person is, that is push the button, except in this case, it's aliens. So we had a group of six people. Four people were passengers and two people were aliens, but nobody knew who the aliens were except for the people that had it on their phone. You know, that shows on their phone that you are the alien. This other person is an alien. You guys have to hide that until the end of the game. So the rest of the game... The two aliens are trying to pretend that they're not aliens, and then they and then the game will ask you personal questions about that that you would answer that you want to answer correctly. But each person takes a turn, and they select three people from the group to go in like a like an interrogation chamber or something. And the, whoever is in the interrogation chamber may have they won't see the same question. They'll be given a different question, so their answer is going to look jacked up. And then everybody else uses that as an idea to see who's lying, who didn't see the correct answer, and it all became a whodunit, who's the alien. And then it works clue style, where the team has to 100% agree, we think these two people are the aliens, we try it out, they get thrown out into space, if they're the aliens, we win, if not, we lose. It's 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 really great, but it takes a minute to figure out. I'm I'm actually kind of curious on that one because with games like Werewolf or Mafia, they tend to be more fun the more people you have. Right. So I, I feel that that game would probably be ideal if you had the full eight person. Probably. And I haven't played it with full eight, but six was great. It was It was really good. And I also like that in Mafia, you kind of have to, you have to have the eye contact. You know, with everybody, you have to, like, lie to somebody's face where it's easier to lie to your phone. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that that made it a lot of fun. So I enjoyed Push the Button quite a bit, and I think we're going to be playing that one a lot more. Role Models is a, is a game where you really have to know the people you're playing with. So this one, playing streaming with somebody isn't going to work quite as well. Uh, it's It's a – you're basically – creating characteristics for people based on their on their questions. You're you're guessing who they are based on how they answer questions or who did this and it's a fun little social experiment more than anything else. It's not the, it's probably my least favorite in the series. Um and I think we only played it once or twice cuz cuz it didn't it, it was it was okay. But we were also playing with like Spencer came to the party and and it was the first time he had met this group of friends. So he didn't know any anybody. He didn't know when somebody was lying because he didn't know their answers. So mm. uh, you really have to know the people real well to uh, for that one to work. But Trivia Murder Party and Push the Button Alone are worth the 25 bucks, um, And the others are still fun. Uh, and Joke Boat actually is pretty fun too. So I, I, those those three definitely make it worth it. But even if this if you just bought Trivia Murder Party 2, I think it would be worth it. That game is a riot. I'm I'm talking. I was in the next room while while there was a full eight people playing, including kids, by the way, and they're cheering and laughing when because the the final round is like a showdown and it's like it's like tense and the music is pumping up and everybody's cheering and hollering. It is it is fantastic to play with a group of people. So uh, I feel like I say this with every Jackbox Party Pet that comes out, but easily recommended. 
if you have enough people to play this with. It's 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 silly not to play it if you got a big group of people. Yeah. It's so much fun. And Jack Party Party Pack Six just delivers even then some. What if you hate fun? If you hate fun, then uh, why do you play video games? For the story. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I want to cry. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on. I Jackbox Party Pack 6. Play it. Buy it. Play it with me. We should stream that one. Maybe do some trivia, murder trivia party. That'd be fun. You two have been playing a game called One Night Stand. I know that, uh, Zach, you've been playing it on PS4. CB, you've been playing it on Xbox. This looks like a point-and-click adventure where you wake up after a one-night stand with somebody, and you have to figure out how to deal with it. Tell me, tell me, is that about right? Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> now, I can't tell from the trailer. Are you the character looking at the, at the woman, or are you the woman? You are the character looking at the woman. Okay, so you're a guy that wakes up next to a, a woman after a one-night stand, and you're just choosing dialogue options? Uh, yes, yes and no. You're also playing a little bit of a private investigator of your own, you know, night because you can't remember anything. Oh, okay. So you're trying, you're trying, you're trying to figure out where you are, and you're like, I don't know this woman's name. You're doing a hangover. You're trying to backtrack and learn why you're yeah, there. That's exactly yeah. But you know, you're like, I don't know this woman's name. Like, but then you you can click on her wallet, and you're like, oh, should I be looking through this? The answer is yes. And <laughs> but you'll maybe you'll find out that. Uh, you know, she's got one ID that says one name, and she's got another ID that says another name. Oh, yeah, a little yeah, mystery yeah. going on. It's absolutely. How old is she really? Yeah, yeah, that that, that does come up. <laughs> it it's yeah. a it's a very interesting take on a point and click adventure, especially with the subject matter. Mm-hmm. Um, I banging. <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> I how did did you hundred percent this game yet, Zach? Not yet. No, I, I I want to. I want to keep going through it. Okay. Uh, but I got I got distracted by a knight's quest. Yeah, I I hundred percent of this game. So I got all twelve endings. Wow, your wife must be thrilled. Um. Well, <laughs> it's not like he was playing it for tips. <laughs> nope, nope, not not these days. Uh, it, uh, it's it's definitely very interesting with how how you can play out some of the scenarios because like one of the playthroughs you can literally finish in less than two minutes. It's Oh, wow. But there's another one that probably takes closer to 20. Yeah. Yeah. Each playthrough is only probably 30 minutes at the most. And mm-hmm. then on, on, on subsequent playthroughs, you can fast forward through any dialogue you've seen. Yes. So it's really about, it's really about kind of exploring for these different endings. Gotcha. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's, it's cute. It's cute. I don't know. I I thought it. <laughs> I it guess looked, you were. It looked darker than, a, than well, cute I meant, to me. I meant for like how the game plays out. It's it's cute in the fact that there's different ways to play through this game. The subject matter at times, yes, it is very dark, but mm-hmm. well, it's sometimes goofy as well. Yes. So there's you know, there's some fun ones. It runs the game, and I think it's an interesting. You know, a little exploration. It's it's only a couple dollars. It is. I don't know. I thought it was super neat trying to piece it together and kind of seeing the different avenues of. Because if you on one playthrough you look through that wallet and you can guess her name, you can get it right, you get it wrong. Uh, but you can also just not look through the wallet and now you don't have that information. So she's like, "Oh my god, do you even remember my name?" You don't have any information to give her. Ah, which is kind of cool. And does it ever reach kinda- any levels of risqueness? Like uh, mm, not no, you know, not really. In fact, what I, what I think is interesting is I don't think there is an ending where you kind of like have sex again. I think I think the most you can do is oh, let's have coffee sometime. Yeah, yeah. like that's as risque as it gets. Setting up for the Although sequel. I guess, I guess you can steal her panties. That's kind of risque. <laughs> I'll I'll tell you right now, wow. you can actually wear them. Yes, I know. I got that ending. So, uh. It's it's definitely it's 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 kind of you put on her panties and she comes back in and goes like what the hell it's awesome yeah so some of the some of the dialogue options or choices you can make are very weird uh there there's actually an ending where it talks about how you just run out of the house butt naked and are proud of yourself and walk down the street yeah it's pretty great you strut your stuff in hat like in pride. 
as you find your way to the nearest bus station and then just the sound of sirens plays in the background. <laughs> That's um, funny. But, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, there's a lot of the idea of this the entire, you know, I mean, it's like an interactive narrative, like, a you know, Detroit or something like that, I guess, mm-hmm. like no more interactive than that. But it's it's cool to play a game where, you know, the entire setting is a room. Yes. And it's all hand drawn animation. Yeah, it's a uh, rotoscoped. Right? Yep. Like the woman is rotoscope, which is cool. You don't see that every day anymore. Is that where it's like live video that they've turned into animation? Is that what that means? Yeah. Where they, where you like draw over yeah. real animation, kind of like Prince of Persia. Yeah. I was going to ask you because like, it looked almost realistic, but arty at the, arty at the same time. That was going to be my next question. It, so yeah. it almost feels like uh, the, the one Incubus uh, music video. Uh, for part of me. Japanese. Where it's all drawn. Was that part of me? Know. God, I can't remember. Anyway, well, uh, that's I just that's I not... just know like my brain made the connection, but it didn't quite fully piece everything together. So you guys recommend yeah. it? I I do yeah. absolutely. It's it's only a couple dollars. It's I appreciate when something is different. You know, it doesn't really play like much else. And fun fact: the woman is a developer herself. Oh, that's cool. Hmm. Yeah, I think on Xbox it's four ninety nine. Yeah, same on PS4, but it's 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 for yeah five bucks. You know the the cost of a king size Snickers. <laughs> what? Check out. I don't know. Well, at least where you live. I was gonna say, where are you getting five dollars for a Snickers bar? Is this a good deal or a bad deal? Sounds That's like a, a deal, terrible right? deal. Yeah. <laughs> okay, for the si- for the price of a latte, there you go. You get a fully interactive experience with twelve different endings that run the gamut of serious to dark to goofy to light. It's kind of it's neat. Um, also, if you're an achievement or trophy hunter, easy thousand or sold whatever platinum trophy crap you pe- yes, PlayStation people thank you. have. <laughs> I know. I'm like, do I do I spend sixty dollars just to get a trophies in the Outer Worlds? And the answer is no. But I did think about it. <laughs> you really did. All right. So, yeah, highly recommended. I don't know. That's cool. Very cool. That is One Night Stand. And you guys, again, on PS4 and Xbox. CB, you've also been playing Ghostbusters, the video game remastered, which I know this game came out on 360 back in the day and PS3. Uh, But you're playing on Xbox One. And I've never got to play this game. And I just, I really want to know because I, I feel bad that I missed this one. I have no idea how this plays. Is it a third-person shooter where you trap ghosts, or how does it work? It is a third-person shooter where you trap ghosts, and I also missed it the first time around because I had a faulty disc. I feel like you two are the target audience for this thing. Yes, Uh, especially if you are a fan of the Ghostbusters franchise. Uh, I played this game, and I had not even seen Ghostbusters yet. Wow. Yeah, I, I actually very much enjoyed this experience, uh, mostly because I'm a huge Ghostbusters fan. It's a third person shooter where you are a new recruit to the team and you go around uh, with the other Ghostbusters catching and destroying ghosts and trying to figure out a paranormal story that takes place after Ghostbusters 2. Oh, okay. And it's worth noting that the original voice cast is in this. You got... Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, Bill Murray, um, like Ernie Hudson. Ernie Hudson, thank you. Uh, you also have Annie Potts, Brian uh, Doyle, who played the mayor in the first movie, mm-hmm. and the guy who played Walter Peck, William Aberthon. I'm going to miss him. Yep. I didn't realize I got the whole cast oh, back, well, except for Sigourney Weaver. Actually, Sigourney Weaver was supposed to be in this, but she didn't agree to it until Dan Aykroyd signed on. Because uh, originally oh. Dan, uh, not Dan Aykroyd, uh, Bill Murray signed on. Because originally oh. Bill Murray didn't want to do this, and they were going to place his character with Ben Stiller. Oh, what? Yep. So that sounds more expensive. So they were <laughs> yeah. they were going to do that, uh, but it it plays out very well. The the mannerisms of the original cast are all there. They act exactly like they did in the movies. Uh, they go through a lot of the familiar set pieces, like the Sedgwick Hotel from the first one. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the museum from the second one. Uh, there's a lot of time in the firehouse, so you can nice. kind of play around with that. Uh, overall, due to the fact that I did play some of the 360 version, uh, the remaster is definitely a lot more cleaned up and a lot more fluid. Uh, 
there are some issues I take with it. Like for being a remaster, there are areas that are like very dark and still kind of clunky. So like you'll be walking through a shadowed area and you'll bump into something and you can't see it just because it doesn't feel that they kind of gave that treatment right. But this, the story overall is like really, really fun. I mean, I've I've heard people say that this is what they wanted out of Ghostbusters three. Is it to that caliber? Uh, well, this the script that they used was actually the script that Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd wrote for three. Like this is what oh. three was originally intended to be, as far as like the major plot points, gotcha. and then they just kind of expanded upon it to add in your character. Uh, so it's it's a very enjoyable experience in the fact that now that I've actually gone through and played it and be like, man, I really wish this was made into a movie somehow. So. Well, we are getting a Ghostbusters movie, aren't we? With- there, There is a brand new one coming, not the answer, the call one that no one asked for. But you cannot, but you cannot have the original cast anymore. The, well, not the all of it. You but, can have yeah, so this the is... entire original cast minus Rick Moranis and uh, Harold Ramis. Let me just interject. You said you wish this was a movie? Yes. It's better than it's a video game, huh? How do you say that? It's interactive. Remember, the media. this medium is the strongest medium. Yes, but I feel that as a movie, you could have cut out a lot of the fluff and just... Yeah, I also remember this game being quite repetitive. Uh, yeah. And there, there, it does have some repetitive points. They've, they've kind of cleaned it up a little from the first version, uh, nice and game. added in yeah. some more ghost types, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and they found like new ways to tell stories, uh, seeing some of the old familiar ghosts, like the stay puffed marshmallow man and Gozer makes an appearance. So. But if if you haven't watched the first two movies, there are some inside jokes that you'll miss. So if you plan on playing this, I would recommend watching both the movies first and then playing through it. Zach? Well, I, the, I, I started playing the game and then I was like, oh, I should probably actually finally watch this movie. And then I watched it. Oh, OK. I was like, oh, this is OK. Um, v- Vigo the Carpathian is in it as well. No, oh, nice. Voiced by the actual person that did it in the movie as well. Oh, that's it cool. Really, it really is if you if you're a fan of the movies there's really no there is no reason you should not play this game. Yes, it it is definitely marketed towards fans of the series. It is Ghostbusters 3. Essentially, yes. I mean, that's what that's what Dan Aykroyd kept saying, I remember when they were advertising. Well, it. I mean, even if you go on like the Xbox Live Marketplace, the trailer for this game is Dan Aykroyd talking to you like in real life. So he's like, yeah, you need to play this. Like, this is essentially what the game was. He man, he is not play it. he is not aged well. So I'm kind of curious to see yeah, how right. the the new movie plays out because he would be a very large um, Ghostbuster. Ghostbuster. <laughs> yeah, he's also like crazy. Yeah, he's got Skullhead vodka. I yeah, say he's selling vodka now. So. All right, well, CB, thanks for that. I am looking forward to playing that one. I it's it's on my list of backlog now too because I, I I missed it and I've heard good things and I want to check it out. So, but alas, uh, before we let you go, I've got four more recorded interviews for you on games that we've been reviewing. I got Thomas Bex reviewing a game called Neocab. Spencer doing a game called Stranded Sales. Chad stops by to talk about a game called Pin Redux. I'm sorry, Ping Redux. And Joel Selinski reviewed Sniper Elite 3 for us. We got all those reviews for you right now. I'm here once again with my good friend Thomas Bex from over in Ireland. How you doing, Thomas? I'm good, Scott. How are you? How's life in Chicago area? It's going well. It's starting to get a little cooler over here. I'm definitely not ready for winter, but what you going to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, at least you get winter. We just have one long spring slash fall. There you here. go. There you go. <laughs> Well, anyway, you were here to talk to us about a game you're playing called Neocab. This one comes from a developer by the name of Chance Agency, and Evolve PR hooked us up with this review copy so that you could check this game out. I know this is one that you're really interested in because you love the point-and-click adventures, and this one looks very similar to a previous game that you reviewed for us where you were in a cab. What was the name of that one? Uh, Night Call. Night Call. This looked like that, but it looks like it has a more of an 80s synth vibe. That one I know took place in... Paris and it was kind of black and white, but this one looks a little bit more futuristic with this noir 
80s soundtrack going on in the background? Is that is that an accurate description? They are eerily similar, yet um, also not, okay. if you catch my drift. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, when it comes to gameplay and premise, they are almost exactly the same. Okay. Uh, as in, um, in Nightcall, you played a taxi driver in uh, modern-day Paris who got uh, script, conscript, conscripted to help in an investigation trying to find a serial killer, and he does that by talking to his customers all the while trying to keep his taxi going and surviving. And out at the end of the week, uh, the cop who... Um, scripted him uh, he wants she wants to know who he thinks the killer is now in this game in neocap you uh play a uh, it's a it's a cyberpunk game mm-hmm. uh it's it takes place in the future and uh you play lena who is like a futuristic uber driver although it's not called uber it's called neocap and she's starting a new life in los ojos um think la and um She's going to move in with her best friend, Savvy, and she is driving her cab and she's meeting with her friend and her friend disappears. So what she's trying to do is uh, instead of us trying tracking a serial killer, she's trying to find the what happened to her friend and um, still trying to keep her taxi going by meeting the um, required number of uh, rides each day and also keeping her... Um, a star rating above four. Okay. So when you uh, pick up a passenger, uh, you need to make sure that you have enough uh, electricity to drive to where the passenger needs to go. And uh, you learn something, either something that has to do with the mystery of your disappeared friend, or uh, you learn something about the city, or you learn something about the uh, big conglomeration called Capra, that is your main competitor, but they have all these self-driving taxis, and you are a real person driving a t- driving a cab. Oh, interesting! It almost sounds like it's got a little. Um, oh, what's the name of the movie? I, I I'm not a fan of it. The Harrison Blade Ford Runner? movie, Blade Runner. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's got that vibe going. Yeah, okay, definitely. Well, tell me about the gameplay because it wasn't very clear in the trailer. Is this just choosing dialogue options? Is that pretty much the whole crux of the game? Yes, okay. um, that is that is basically the entire game, um, but it is influenced by certain things. You choose dialogue options when you have a passenger in your car, or you choose your destinations on the map of Los Ojos, and that could also be a destination where you want to go to to investigate uh, the disappearance of your friend. Um, so it does not necessarily always have to do with the three or four customers you drive around. You can also try and pick a customer that has something to do with the disappearance of your friend. So you're combining your um, uh, your job with your investigation. Okay. Uh, once you have a passenger in the in the car, uh, they either start talking to you or you can talk to them, and uh, a conversation happens. But the thing that makes this game different is you have a feel grid, and that is a an um, an armband that basically shows your emotion, and it shows it in four colors, um, like a mood ring, like a mood ring that actually works. That's that's how they describe it in game as well. Okay. So you have red, which means angry, blue, which means sad or depressed and then they have green and yellow and i think yellow was happy and green was um relaxed something like that and there are nuances between them but those are the the four main colors and that can influence your uh options in the dialogue uh for instance sometimes if a customer has pissed you has pissed you off your uh feel grid turns red I've had that a customer says, oh, I'm so sorry that I I clearly uh, annoyed you a lot. Uh, Please uh, um, uh, accept my apologies. And then you go back a bit more towards yellow, for instance. Or I've also had that uh, I I wanted to pick certain dialogue options, but I couldn't because it said, no, you're way too angry now to respond like this. Oh, interesting. Now, do you have any control uh... over that emotion or is is it just purely based on whatever is said to you? 
No, it's also also based on how you respond to that person. Gotcha. So you can uh, you can respond kindly or you can respond aggressively. Yes, and that is a major influence on how the game ends. So the I, I started playing it a second time, but the first time the game did not end entirely positively for me. Uh, it did not end the way I was hoping it would end because I let myself get um, agitated and therefore could not give the answers I thought I needed to get the game to a certain point. So it got to a different point, got to a different ending. Interesting. And, it almost sounds like a social uh, experiment at that point. It is a bit like that. Yeah, it, um, uh, the, the characters emote a lot. I, I think the graphics are great. Uh, it's very distinct style, uh, but especially the, you as the main character, Lena, she emotes uh, very, very well. You see the mood changes not only on the color of her feel grid, but also on her face. So that is uh, that is just very interesting and very well done. And it, it opens the game also up because it's not that long a game. I think I played it for like four or five hours. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't need to be an experienced adventure gamer. You know, you, it's not like you have to solve all these difficult puzzles. No, it's purely the interaction you have with your customers and with the people, um, uh, with your friends and those who can help you. So it's 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 very accessible to uh, to basically everyone if you like uh, these kind of stories because the mystery as most dystopian slash cyberpunk stories has to do with um, automation versus people, um, uh, corporations trying to take over uh, uh, human life and, and God knows what else. You know, there's always this political undercurrent, this technological undercurrent that is in these stories. And this, this story is, is no exception to that because it, it is really a cyberpunk story in that way, just not with... Uh, implants or uh, weaponry or anything. Gotcha. So you recommend so, this one? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's a very interesting story. It has got good re replayability. It looks great. It sounds great. Um, it's. I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. All right. Well, that is NeoCab, and I know you played it on PC, but just for everybody out there that might be interested in it, it's also available on Nintendo Switch. You can play it on Mac, and it's even available on Apple Arcade. So if you're in that subscription service, you can play it on there as well. Uh, and, and again, shout out to Evolve PR for uh, hooking Thomas up with a review here so we could get that review coverage to you. And uh, yeah, there's also going to be a written review for this on the website in the coming uh, in the next few days or so. So keep an eye out for that. But Thomas, thanks so much for stopping by to talk to us about NeoCab. No problem, Scott. Uh, hopefully next time you can uh, come over here. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. We'll have to do. I'll have to get over there some point. We'll do an episode uh, live from Ireland. How about that? I love it. <laughs> All right, you have a good one, man. You too, man. Bye. Bye. What's up, Spencer? How you doing today, man? Oh, not too bad. How are you, Scott? Doing all right. Had a good time this weekend playing some Killer Queen Black with you. That was a lot of that was a blast, wasn't it? Oh man, that was amazing. Such a great game. It reminds me of Joust. It really does. It's uh, very reminiscent of that game for sure. But you're here to talk to us about a game that you've been reviewing for us on Switch called Stranded Sails: Explorers of the Cursed Islands. This one comes from developer Lemon Bomb Entertainment and was provided to us by Evolve PR for review purposes. I'm really curious to hear about this one because. This looks very much like a Harvest Moon type uh, type game with farming simulator thrown in there. Is that an accurate assessment or my way off? No, that's per that's actually very accurate. Um, what I'm getting the vibe on is uh, the it looks like Harvest Moon. It feels like Harvest Moon and it reminds me of Farmville. Uh, if anybody of those played that on Facebook, mm -hmm. um, that and that's what it feels like to me. I don't know, man. Farmville on Facebook sounds like a turnoff to a lot of people. Is it? Uh, is, is it one where you're having to request friends to come play with you and and clutter up their social media? Uh, no, thank God. Okay. <laughs> so, how's the gameplay work? What do you do in this one? Um, so, start off in this game. You go on a boat trip with your friends and father. When you get to a certain point. You crash into a couple of rocks, I'm assuming, and you get stranded onto some islands. So gameplay on that, you have to pretty much go around and find everything to build shacks, make a garden, get food for everybody, and pretty much just exploring the, f I think there's one, two, three, four, five islands that you explore. Okay. 
So this sounds more like a survival type game. Like you're stranded on a on a desert island and you have to, you know, build shelter and find food and keep everybody healthy. It's a simulation type game. Yeah, pretty much. It's um some of the people that I've uh talked to about it, they've said it sounds like or feels like uh, the Sims game. Oh, okay. Well, I think if people like Sims, they're going to get real excited to hear that. Yes. But uh, when watching the trailer, it looked like there was some combat in there as well. Is there some hack and slash going on? From what I've seen, yes. I have not witnessed that so far because I've gotten I've gotten to an issue with that. Okay. Let's go ahead and jump into that, actually. And before we mention this, I want to say that we have actually heard from the development team about uh, a known glitch in this game, and they are working on it. So... We're waiting for you to write the review until that glitch is patched. Uh, but tell us about the issue that you've got, you've been have it experiencing. When you get to a certain point in the game, and the part is you're looking for three pieces to a sword. Mm-hmm. After you make it to that, you get the ability to build bridges. Uh, you get a bri- bridge kit. Wait a minute. A sword helps you build a bridge? <laughs> no. Uh, it's. I guess it's part of a quest that you have to get for somebody, and then she, in the quest, the quest giver, um, helps you build a few bridges. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. So with that being said, with the this glitch of some sort, my inventory went missing. So two out of the three pieces for the sword went missing. This was on one save set. When I tried to play it through the game again to fix this issue, hopefully, it, all of my inventory went missing. Oh, that's that's a problem. So you really couldn't progress any further than that, yeah? No, I couldn't. And I, the problem is, is I don't I couldn't figure out how far I was in the game to determine gotcha. where I was at. Well, hopefully that gets patched up. But outside of that, are you enjoying the game, what you played so far? Yes, I do. Uh, um, I've enjoyed it so far. It's a great game, and I will continue playing it once the patch gets um, released. I know that okay, they have so two other patches out right now for save issues and something else I can't remember off the top of my head. All right, so it sounds like you uh, highly recommend this game for people to check out. Yes. All right, and uh, that, again, is Stranded Sails. Explorers of the Cursed Islands. I hope that gets patched for you, man, so you can finish up that game. Awesome. Thank you. Not a problem. Thanks for coming on. Hey there, Chad. How you doing, man? Good, Scott. How you doing tonight? I'm doing all right. We had a, we had a good time at the party this weekend, did we not? I, I think so. Um, yeah. You might have to remind me. No, it, was, it was a blast <laughs> playing a Killer Queen with everybody and all that. Oh, man. We had such a blast. So much yelling and screaming. It was, it was insane. But you were here not to talk about uh, Killer Queen Black. You were here to talk about a game that you've been reviewing for us. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Ping Redux. Am I saying that right? That's what I'm going with. Okay. And this one comes from a developer by the name of Nami Tentu. Again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I hope I got that right. And uh, the developer actually provided us with a copy of this to check out. And I watched the trailer, and I got to be honest, I have no clue what is going on with this game. It looks like Pong with a purpose. Is, is, that, is that about right? I mean, I guess that's one way you could relate it, because the description that you see written places is, like, is Ping Pong Puzzler. Okay. So you are bouncing a, a little cube around. Um, and are you trying to break bricks like Arkanoid style, or are you trying to get the ball to certain areas, or what are you trying to do? In general, you're trying to get to an orange sphere that's located somewhere on the screen, and you oh, have okay. to pass. There's certain barriers you bounce off of. There are certain barriers that break. There's some that move, and there's some that you don't see until you hit or turn a light on or something like that. Okay. So how do you fire it? I mean, are you given like any direction that you want to go and then you just release it? Or is there a power gauge? What do you do? That's part of the simplicity of this game is there's um, two things you control, and that's your aim and shooting. And that's it. That's it. So this, the puzzle will start. You'll see the screen moving, and it'll be moving at its normal pace. But the moment you hit the directional stick, you see your cursor showing where you're aiming at and Things kind of go in slow mo, actually, while you're aiming. For like precise which, aiming, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, and that actually does help um, with some of the more difficult puzzles, especially. But then you just aim and shoot where you want to go. Now, there are caveats where certain boards you actually get multiple times where you can shoot, so you can readjust while you're moving and aim a oh, different so, way. So that's the the crux, so to speak, is that you you only have a certain number of shots. Or you well, have to main, do it in one shot. 
the main most of them are going to be in one shot the main um decider of how well you do on the board is how many bounces you take to get to the goal oh, okay. you, you do have a rating system like angry birds and things like three that. stars exactly so if it takes so many bounces you get bronze so many silver so many gold and you're earning them throughout the board now when you get extra shots generally you're going to need those so those really aren't your judgment but you only get so many of them gotcha I mean, there was one board where you get six total shots and it's because you've kind of got to work around some corners mm. that normally wouldn't be able to bounce around. And this has got like over 100 levels in it, right? Yeah, and they do that by keeping it as simple as possible. I mean, this game is as basic as can be when it comes down to like the menus and everything outside of the puzzles. Okay. Um, the, the main menu is you select your Xbox profile and then you hit A and it loads up whatever worlds you have unlocked at that point. There's up to 12 worlds, hence the over 100 puzzles. There's eight or nine puzzles per world, so that adds up to that. So you need a certain number of stars to unlock the later ones, is that right? It seems like it, but you can't see anywhere on screen how many it takes to unlock anything. It does keep track of how many you have, but you don't know how many unlocked what. Uh, and actually, you don't even know when you've opened a new world until you go back to the main menu just to check. <laughs> That's interesting. So yeah, the first time, actually, I noticed it because I happened to go back to the main menu, um, which the main menu is just your world select screen, because, again, that's the only menu. Right. It allowed me to go past a puzzle that I could not get past. Okay. And so that's when I noticed other worlds were open as well, because I went back to the menu. Here's the thing that drew me to this game when I first watched this trailer, is it looks like it's taking notes from a lot of classic games like it's the the graphics are obviously very pixelated but i got like a yara's revenge level it looked like uh obviously pong uh space invaders i saw a lot of familiar tropes from older games there's tons of throwbacks throughout the game that's part of the idea i mean it's definitely an 8-bit throwback maybe a little 16-bit but mostly 8-bit stuff Mm -hmm. Um, even one of like they actually have boss levels in this game that are puzzles where Sometimes you do have an enemy you have to hit so many times by bouncing off of it, or one of them is a Space Invader-style boss where you're beating enemies that look like kind of little Space Invader-type guys but aren't. You have to beat so many of them to get through it, so... Gotcha. And the backgrounds always have some sort of reference to an old game. Every background does. Um, There's usually a theme in the worlds with the backgrounds uh, going from game to game. I think it looks like a lot of fun. I was actually a little jealous that you got to review this one because it seems like a game I would enjoy. Would you recommend it for our listeners to check out? It is fun to play. It's it's a $5 game. Mm-hmm. And actually, one thing I thought of that is kind of a really big selling point to it, because some of the puzzles you're going to fly through really fast and others you might get stuck on for a little while. Mm-hmm. I mean, you might finish five puzzles within five minutes and then spend 10 minutes on another one. But one of our members uh, was posting recently like their... Um, Xbox controller with their phone hookup. Yeah. Like that would be kind of like the perfect thing for this. The be Project it, Cloud is what yeah, you're referring to. Yeah. Take it mobile that way because you still have the directional pad to use the controls. Mm-hmm. And it's, it doesn't need a good network. It doesn't need anything strong to run. And you can do your puzzles on the go. I think it's like a perfect application for what Xbox is doing, trying to spread their stuff out on other platforms. Nice. Which makes sense to have it on Steam and Xbox. I mean, it is fun overall. You're, you're not getting a story out of it, so it's not like a portal or an unravel where there's going to be a story with the puzzles. It is just how many bounces does it take you to get to the orange sphere and move on. I still think it sounds uh, great in its simplicity, and and, and uh, one I, I may have to pick up and check out because it seems like something I would I would enjoy a great deal. So again, that is Ping Redux, and thank you to uh, Nami Tentu for uh, allowing us to review that. We do appreciate it, Chad. Thanks for playing it and for sharing it with our community. My pleasure, Scott. You have a good one, man. I'll talk to you all soon. Sounds good. Catch you later. Joel Selinski, how you doing, man? Good. How are you doing, Scott? I'm doing well. Haven't had you on in a little bit. I wanted to, to talk to you about a game that you've been reviewing for us called Sniper Elite 3 Ultimate Edition. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is an older game that's got a Switch port. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. It's been on a few other systems and just recently uh, ported over to the Switch. Yeah, I know it's on PC, PS3, Xbox 360, and then they've even got ports over on PS4, Xbox One. But you played the Switch version. They're calling it the Ultimate Edition. And uh, what does that Ultimate Edition include? 
basically it includes all the extra paid DLC that the game had uh, all the way through everything they released. Okay, and I've never played the Sniper Elite games. Uh, I, you know what, I take that back. I think I might have played one of them. Uh, there was a co-op one I played, and I can't remember which one it was, but how does the gameplay work? Just uh, you know, very kind of sum it up for those who have never played this series. Sure, so you're basically a lone single sniper behind enemy lines or infiltrating an enemy camp. The idea is to complete the mission objectives and either be completely silent, hidden, or go in guns blazing and see if you can make it. The game really leaves it up to you how you want to handle all the situations. I imagine if you're playing as a sniper, you want to do it stealthy and you know hide in the bushes and take people out, right? That's got to be more fun. Uh, that is more fun. It's also fun to see if you can just go in guns blazing and take everybody out like you're uh, Rambo. Gotcha. Does this do the slow motion... Like bullet time kind of thing, if you, if you get a headshot or a, or a nut shot or something like that? Is, it, is that this series? Yes, it is, and they are fully intact on the Switch, and they look amazing. Okay, very cool. Well, talk to me about the Switch version. How is it? I know that the, a lot of games have been ported to the Switch, and there's been some complaints because the, the system isn't nearly as powerful as, say, the Xbox One or the PS4. How does it play on the Switch? It plays amazing on the Switch. Uh, to me, this is how a port should be done. Oh, wow. It, Resolution looks good. It's got the high textures that you would see on the PC version of it. It is running at 30 frames a second, which is a plus or a minus depending on how you look at it, because it's a constant 30 frames per second. I didn't experience a single drop in frames, slowness when there wasn't supposed to be any, anything like that, no texture pop in. Um, I know it's running dynamic resolution, so it's doing something in the background, but it's not mm -hmm. readily apparent at all when you're playing. It's just as smooth as, on, as the more powerful systems. Now, did you play it in docked mode? I've played it in both handheld and docked mode to try and see the difference. Uh, handheld, of course, is going to run good because then it's limited to 720p. Right. But it, it runs good docked mode. Um, the Pro Controller is amazing with it. Oh, okay. The Joy-Cons are okay, but I'm not a huge fan of the Joy-Cons just because my hands don't fit them very well. Sure. I can speak to that. We were we were trying to play that with the uh, four-on-four Killer Queen Black this weekend, and everyone was complaining about holding the tiny little controller. So. But I'm not going to invest in eight uh, Elite controllers for one game, so right. I had to suck it up. Yeah, so it works good that way. I did try the motion controls, and if you could get used to it, I can see where they would actually be better than the other versions of the game other than in a PC that has the keyboard and the mouse because it allows you to get close with the joysticks. Then it uses the gyro in the controller to let you make fine movements so that you can get that perfect headshot lined up. Oh, that's really cool. So it sounds like you're, you're digging this game. Had you played it before or is this your first time in, the, in this one? I had played this before, but it has been a long time. I most recently played uh, Sniper Elite 4. Okay, and do you recommend it for our uh, audience to check out? I absolutely recommend it. Like I said, this is how a Switch port should be done. Awesome. Well, again, that is Sniper Elite 3 Ultimate Edition. That comes from Rebellion. And uh, shout out to Evolve PR for hooking you up with a review copy to check that one out. Joel, thanks so much for stopping in and uh, sharing your experience with the game, man. Scott, it's a pleasure as always. Thank you very much. All right, you have a good one. You too. All right, thanks to those guys for hooking us up with those reviews. Zach. After hearing my review of A Knight's Quest, you decided that you wanted to go ahead and play this as well. What are your thoughts on that game? Uh, I can't find the fourth sick guard. Okay. If Does that mean something to you? Yes, it does. I know what you're I'm talking have, about. I might have to uh, ask your help. There are, they're all in the town, so they're all in the town square area. Yeah, no, I'll have that. I'm going to talk to you off there. Oh, okay. It's, uh, all right. it's, uh, it halted my progress entirely. I'm just not as good as you are, Scott, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Well, I mean, what was frustrating in playing this is because it was so new, there was no videos online for it when I was playing through it. So I, I literally couldn't cheat if I wanted to. It feels a little obtuse, the game. But, um, no, I like, I like it a lot. It is exactly what I wanted it to be. It's very Nintendo 64 yes. kind of game. Like, it just, from the boot up to the way it just jumps right into the gameplay, uh, to this, the way that the camera moves when you're talking to townspeople, even, like, everything feels like. These people love the Nintendo 64. I wanted to make one of those. I agree. And yeah. it's, it's great. Uh, the, 
you know, there are a couple of, like uh, frustrations I have. I wish the camera tracked a little better when you're locked onto an enemy. Yep. Because it just kind of hovers outside. Uh, but I love that like the platforming is great. I platforming like is really solid. Like, I was I was almost surprised by it because like make no mistake, as you said, you know, last week, this is a Zelda game. <laughs> With there more platforming no, though. There's no. I mean, he even holds a sword in his left hand. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> yeah. So I was not. So I was not. Even in the trailers, I didn't expect platforming of this degree. Mm-hmm. It really is like Prince of Persia meets Ratchet and Clank with all the grinding. I don't know, it's super cool. I wish the war, I wish the I wish every area was about half as big as it is. Because it doesn't feel like the stuff doesn't feel like it's there for any reason. It just kind of feels like it's there to make the game world bigger. Yeah, or to or to place collectibles, which I still haven't figured out what those keys do. Have you? No, that's absurd. The warp crystal thing that you went on and on about is true. It's in, it's incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Like, how easy and would you, that have been just to leave, leave that alone? Just because they on. make you pass them several times. Mm-hmm. The same ones. And you just walk past them, and they're like, nah, nah, bro, ain't gonna happen for you. And that's just mean. It really is. Honestly. Uh, but no, it's pretty, it's pretty good. I Well, here's, <sighs> here's the funny thing, uh, yeah. Zach, is you're not done walking past them. I know where you are in the game. And yeah. you're you're going to pass them again before you're going to unlock that ability, right? Because you revisit the areas or whatever. Yep. But but it is frustrating because they'll do you know you're about to enter a dungeon and then you need an item, so you go elsewhere for the item, and you're used to modern game sensibilities or even yeah you, know, you could even like couldn't you you could return to areas in Ocarina, right? Even. Yep, I know exactly where you're going with this. Yeah, but it's so you go, you get your item. It's kind of cool, you're like a little narrative beat that follows along. You're like, oh, hey, now I can grind and stuff. And then the game's like, all right, but have fun trekking back for 30 minutes to get back to that dungeon door. That is frustrating. And then they reset the dungeon. Awesome. <laughs> so. And then like all the enemies are back and everything, and it's just, it's, yeah, they... They clearly wanted the back of the box to say 30 hours or 40 hours or whatever. They had a they had some target on their publishers, you know, like a mandate or something. Yeah. It is uh <sighs> But I'm I'm pushing past it. You know what I do? I just throw on a podcast when I have those frustrating areas. To make sure I don't throw a controller through anything, but the I I can already tell the game should have been shorter than it was. And if it was, it would be incredible. I agree. Because I texted you the first two hours or so when I was in this, I was like, Scott, I love this game. I don't know what you're talking about. So did I. I loved it. <laughs> the, the way this game opens up in the first dungeon was like, all right, this is a Zelda game through and through. Right. I it's love per- it. it's Zelda with platforming. Oh my God, this is incredible. Yep. And, yeah, and then you get a couple more hours into it, you're like, this is frustrating as hell. Wait till and you you're... get towards the end, man, because I'm in a dungeon right now that is so massive. And you know how the checkpoints work in a dungeon? Like, you don't really get a checkpoint until you go through a door that actually closes behind you, and then it says right. saving. So in the second dungeon, there aren't any doors. Sweet. So you go through this whole thing, and and I'm talking difficult platforming, and they do uh, – I'm stuck on this part where, like, there's a platform that's held by four chains, one on either corner of the of a big square, and somehow you have to finagle the physics – to get the thing like momentum swinging to be able to jump to the next one, but it doesn't work right. And so I sat there and tried doing it over and over and over again. I got it once and then you have to do it a second time and I couldn't do it the second time without dying. And when I died, it started me back at the beginning of the dungeon and the entire dungeon was reset again. It is a, it's a game that gets in the way of itself because you want to love it. All the pieces are there for a great game. Yes. You can tell from the intro, you can tell from, you can tell like it was made by people who cared. They just, they want it to be longer than it needed to be. And they just, they put in too many frustrations along the way. And yes. that sucks. And so many of those frustrations could have easily been avoided. Right. Exactly. Very easily. So it sounds like we're being overly negative about it. There is a lot to, there's a lot of quality stuff going on in this game. It looks gorgeous. I love the music, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's very N64. It's very Final Fantasy. I think it, it loops a little bit more often than Final Fantasy music does, but it 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 feels very adventury in a, in a good way. But I I really like it. There's there's you moments where they drop the audio too, that that is more effective than I would have thought it would be. Oh, that's cool. I was I was gonna say it is a game of high highs and a game of low lows. I think that's fair enough. You know, you're right. It's a roller coaster ride of emotion. Yeah. CB, anything you're catching up on? Uh, just. 
trying to pod through some more uh, Ghost Recon Breakpoint before uh, heavy AAA season hits. <laughs> I we're I think it's hit, man. <laughs> As of Friday, it's gonna it's gonna hit for sure. So. Well, I think that is going to do it for this episode of the Gaming Outsider. Zach, any parting words or recommendations for the listeners? Oh, I don't, you know, hey, Absolute uh, Carnage is out. Keep reading that, guys. Fourth issue. Oh, my God, it's crazy. Venom Hulk. It's the first time Hulk's ever been venomized. So that's cool. That sounds nuts. CB, what about it's you? Brand. Um, It's October, and I'm still watching a lot of B-roll horror. Uh, I watched <laughs> Chopping Mall and Slumber Party Massacre 1 and 2 this last week. I have never heard of any of those. They are awful, but Chopping Mall is worth checking out just because it's mildly hilarious. All right. Sounds good. Uh, for B-roll movies, for me, I might have mentioned on this show before, but Sleepaway Camp, I need to get a group together to watch Sleepaway Camp because that movie is so ridiculous. I try every year to watch it with somebody that's never seen it before. Ah, oh, so good. Uh, anyway, as for me, you can also uh, listen to my Packers fan podcast, uh, same place you listen to this show. And also, I'm going to be a guest on the Hollywood Outsider this week as well. We're going to be talking about movie sequels and uh, set some rules for when sequels should be made and uh, what uh, what rules should be followed in making them. So stay tuned for that. But thank you so much for listening to the Gaming Outsider. Please be sure to email us if you have any questions or concerns. Our address is feedback at thegamingoutsider.com. Until next week, I'm Scott Clark with Zach Parkerson and Chris Berensmeyer, and we are The Gaming Outsider. And remember, there's no such thing as a bad game, just games that aren't for you.